Hi, I'm John Taylor Gatto, and this is What You've Been Missing. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Calvin Coolidge, 1933. Greetings and welcome. I'm your host and navigator, Richard Grove, and this is a very special interview episode of What You've Been Missing, featuring the gentle tone, scholarly insights, and wealth of wisdom that combines in the form of John Taylor Gatto, the legendary educator, author, and icon of liberty who offers a lifetime of perspectives on the origins, intentions, and destiny of the compulsory public school system. This five-hour journey represents a landmark in American history and was filmed over two days on July 4th weekend, 2011, in the Constitution State of Connecticut. This is a comprehensive interview session which not only memorializes John's life's work, but also embodies a return of our birthright as human beings. Truly an event which is relevant and relative to each and every one of us. This message applies to children and adults, parents and grandparents, students and teachers, administrators and politicians, blue collar, white collar, no collar, everyone who uses words and symbols to meet their needs, everyone who depends on accurate information to thrive and survive in this world. The purpose of this interview with John is to provide each and every individual with the essential facts which pertain to our survival here on earth, both as individuals and as a species, and yet have been censored from our public schooling. The envisioned outcome would be for each and every human being to possess the knowledge and understanding which allows them to exercise intellectual self-defense and self-liberty, thereby succeeding in pursuing and attaining happiness. It's designed to be shared and studied by individuals and groups to provide the evidence, organize the ideas, and facilitate the constructive conversations and actions necessary to address the root causes of our ever-growing incoherence as human beings. Since this interview contains over 200 footnotes and references and discusses the contents of more than 30 classic books essential to understanding life here on Earth, I would humbly recommend that your first viewing be invested into just soaking in this information and consider it for yourself, and after thinking about it, to then view it again with the intent of looking up the references to embolden your understanding and clarify the focus of your new, expanded perspectives. This interview session could be screened over five hours, five months, or five years, as it could take that long to consume the primary and secondary source materials referred to herein. Most importantly, what you get out of the Ultimate History lesson will be in direct proportion to the amount of attention and focus that you can invest into it. As each hour of the interview progresses into another, you are literally crossing thresholds of discovery. And by hour five, the layers of these discoveries yield a truly inspiring realization. That being said, the conversation which forms the entirety of this interview is almost entirely composed of facts and references pointing toward a preponderance of evidence, which is, for the most part, unknown to the general public. And it has everything to do with the myriad of crises which face humanity, starting with our own incoherence and inability to problem solve our way forward. We're not asking you to agree with us nor to believe what we're saying. We're simply trying to provoke you into looking into these matters for yourself by providing you with an accurate map which leads to your own factual and substantial understanding of reality. For as Aristotle once wrote, it is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. Through these interview sessions with John, you're going to be introduced 
to a variety of historical personalities and, we hope, curious to review the history which has led us to this point. And to that end, this is not about disproving or debunking what we've been taught so much as it is a journey of discovery to discern reality and to discover our birthright as human beings so that we might go forward in order to meet the challenges we all face here on this planet together. This is truly something that corporate establishment media, public schools, and universities cannot afford to teach us. So without further ado, let us begin, as they say, at the beginning. On December 15, 1935, John Taylor Gatto was born in western Pennsylvania in the coal mining and steel milling town of Monongahela, about 35 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. During his early school years, he spent a year at an elite Jesuit boarding school near Latrobe, Pennsylvania, where, as you'll soon hear, he learned to think dialectically and was beaten sufficiently by the nuns to create his outspoken temperament, which has endured lifelong. John did undergraduate work at Cornell University, the University of Pittsburgh and Columbia University, and then served in the United States Army Medical Corps at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and Fort Sam Houston, Texas. Following Army service, John did graduate work at the City University of New York, Hunter College, Yeshiva University, the University of California, Cornell and Reed College, which is a private independent liberal arts college located in Oregon. Like many famous American iconoclasts, John first honed his skills in a variety of professions before finding his talent for teaching, which proves to be his real gift to this world. After almost 30 years of teaching in New York City's inner city schools, he was named New York City Teacher of the Year in 1989, 1990, and 1991, and that same year was also named New York State Teacher of the Year. Later in 1991, he wrote a letter announcing his retirement from teaching titled, I Quit, I Think, to the op-ed pages of the Wall Street Journal, stating that he no longer wished to, quote, hurt kids to make a living, end quote. Soon thereafter, he was the subject of a show at Carnegie Hall titled An Evening with John Taylor Gatto, which then launched a career of public speaking in the area of public school reform. He then began a worldwide public speaking and writing career and has received several awards from libertarian organizations, including the Alexis de Tocqueville Award for Excellence in the Advancement of Educational Freedom in 1997. John has been invited to speak all around the world to share his research and has spoken to audiences in Australia, Spain, France, England, Mexico, China, and Canada, as well as every one of the 50 American states. Since his public resignation in 1991, he has traveled over 3 million air miles, spoken at Harvard University, NASA Space Center, the White House, Smith College, Cato Institute, and many other places. He's also been a keynote speaker at over 30 state homeschool conventions, and he supports something called unschooling and open source education for personal learning. In his book, Weapons of Mass Instruction, here's how John defines open source education. Open source learning accepts that everything under the sun might be a possible starting point on the road to self-mastery and a good life. In open source, learning sequences are personally designed or personally signed off on, and everyone you encounter in life is a potential teacher. In open source, teaching is a function, not a profession. Everyone learns and everyone can teach themselves how to learn anything as well as learning how to teach others. In open source, students are the active initiators. You learn that you either write your own script in life or by default, without your input, you become an unwitting actor in someone else's script. The main thesis of John's body of work can best be illustrated, in my opinion, by asking the question, what do public schools actually teach children? And answering it with the main themes contained in John's first book, printed in 1992, titled, Dumbing Us Down. He makes the following observations about how public schools are designed in form and function. Public schooling teaches confusion by breaking coherence. It presents an ensemble of information that the child needs to memorize in order to stay in school. 
Public schooling teaches them to accept their class affiliation. Public schooling makes them indifferent and suppresses natural curiosity. Public schooling makes them emotionally dependent on approval from authority. Public schooling also makes them intellectually dependent on experts and authorities to think on their behalf. Public schooling teaches them a kind of self-confidence that requires constant confirmation by experts and authorities, also known as provisional self-esteem. Public schooling makes it clear to them that they cannot hide, that they are always supervised, under surveillance, especially in today's society where everything online is tracked. Information is sold in a variety of ways to a variety of predators. Bibliography. John's poetic prose and diligent documentation can be studied in his prodigious preponderance of publications, including Dumbing Us Down, the Hidden Curriculum of Compulsory Schooling, 1992. The Exhausted School, 1993. A Different Kind of Teacher, Solving the Crisis of American Schooling, 2000. The Underground History of American Education, 2001. And in my opinion, this is an essential book to read as it stimulates your internal dialogue and draws questions as to why are children being methodically undermined? while simultaneously providing you with the answers and comprehensive references. John also published an article called Against School, published by Harper's Magazine in 2003, and last but not least, Weapons of Mass Instruction, A School Teacher's Journey Through the Dark World of Compulsory Schooling, 2008. John's website is johntaylorgatto.com, and you can help him fund his current projects, sample the underground history of American education, and browse his bookstore. We've also created a special website to support your further study of this project, theultimatehistorylesson.com, which acts as a single point of access to all the media, references, notes and source materials, and bonus features associated with this interview set. Realizing that releasing this information is not enough, we've invested a great deal of effort into organizing and providing you with the research library and all the tools, methods, and resources that you'll need to learn your way forward following this interview. Possibly one of the most useful tools is our use of the personal brain software to enter, organize, and connect all of this information into a comprehensive big picture, literally helping you to connect all of the dots of useful information and formulate a useful understanding. We use the brain internally to help us organize the plethora of prolific facts, artifacts, and personalities that we've encountered while attempting to understand the nature of public education. In addition to hosting the brain models, the ultimatehistorylesson.com also hosts the video files for this interview set, as well as the audio-only versions of this interview in MP3 and CD format so that you can listen to it on the go. This site also hosts the footnotes, links, references, and PDF versions of the classic books discussed, and in the near future we'll be adding subtitles and translation into multiple languages and much more. The ultimatehistorylesson.com links you to our educational media producing partners, as well as the Tragedy and Hope online community, wherein you can leverage the research, methods, and tools in an international online community designed to be a fear-free zone of mutual respect wherein individual explorations are shared to empower everyone with a comprehensive understanding. The Tragedy and Hope online community is free to those who need it and sponsored by the individuals who can afford to support our educational projects. And since this project was funded by more than 50 individuals in the Tragedy and Hope online community, I would especially like to thank those of you who gave us the ability to invite John and produce the ultimate history lesson so that this empowering information can be understood worldwide. We also produced the Peace Revolution podcast, a virtual classroom for adults designed to point out and provide useful perspectives, resources, and organized information. Each episode contains a subject of study essential to understanding a comprehensive view of reality, all of which is focused on providing you with the history contextual information and references, and the various methods and tools so that you can learn for yourself that which public schools cannot afford to provide. Specifically, we've produced episodes 41 through 45 of the Peace Revolution podcast, which feature all five hours of this interview coupled with historical analysis and commentary, which we provide to help you really understand what's being said. 
These episodes amount to another 15 hours of educational content, which is also available on theultimatehistorylesson.com, providing you with the metaphorical handles, if you will, so that you can grasp this material and use it to your own advantage in everyday life. Unlike any other interview you've ever witnessed, the conclusion of the Ultimate History Lesson is actually the starting point on your own personal journey of discovery. Due to the fact that we're trying to do something that hasn't yet been done, I've edited each hour of this interview such that from the crack of the slate until the end of the tape, you're witnessing John in a natural and forthright representation of his presence, and nothing he states in the coming hours has been taken out of order, out of context, or otherwise adjusted for theatrical purposes, as I feel that it would not be to anyone's benefit to change the flow of energy as it happened. These interview sessions are designed to resurrect your curiosity, stimulate your use of reason, inspire you to look around, provoke you into asking questions, sparking your creativity and your inventiveness, igniting the solution-making process in each and every one of us. Its function is to provide you with a ramp to learning, discussion, respectful debate, and compassionate forms of communication as well as constructive action. Here's our one of our interview with John Taylor Gatto, it's time to begin the ultimate history lesson. Thank you for tuning in and not dropping out. You know, for pushing that button, you get a camera credit. That's pretty good. Awesome. I don't even know that we'll need the slides necessarily. I mean, we can start by talking about that. Father, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Grammar, logic, and rhetoric. So, grammar is the Son, logic is the Father, the Holy Ghost is rhetoric, and God is the consciousness. And so the Christian trivium came from the Greek trivium, but they, they used a metaphor to encode it. Now my question to you is, is a metaphor a lie, or is a metaphor something else? I think we better start a little <laughs> less abstract. <laughs> One of the things, a fatigued old brain. <laughs> I actually, I, I arrive at abstraction by arguing with myself through writing. So everything I write goes through about 20 drafts. And since I handwrite it, it's quite painful to re and, and, and throw it out. But I don't really know what I say, what I'm going to say or what I believe until I actually argue with what I think I believe. So what do you think you believe about schooling? I think I believe that the metaphor schooling clearly tells you what it's expected to deliver. The, we only use the, the expression one other way commonly, and that's for the school of fish. And they are wonderful to watch when one fin moves, all of them have thousands of fins move, and they're instantly receptive to what the group wishes. I don't know who gives the original signal, but but education's diametrically opposite to that. I think it starts with the assumption that we get from a fingerprint or from DNA that no two people are alike, and that the ultimate uh, realization of yourself is to find that uniqueness where your apparent physical resemblance to everybody else sort of dissolves as an illusion and you stand absolutely alone or you can select when you want to be part of the larger group. Uh, it seems clear to me that the business of schooling has done what Orwell clearly saw you do, or what uh, Walter Lippmann said you do back in the 1920s. 
you steal the key language of the person you or the group you want to overthrow and you redefine it and people then become confused. It's Newspeak in 1984. So the, the schooling transformation occurs when they see that the language of education is highly regarded, highly respected, and even in people who don't participate, there's an urge in that direction. So you simply take the concepts and you claim that that's why people are being ritualized. Uh, yeah, so there. So you describe that individual beings, when in groups, kind of subvert their own individual thinking power and the, the, the law of identity, none of us can change who we are, we have to be ourselves and that is constant throughout life. So it's about figuring out how to remain individually self-reliant and self-sufficient as going through these systems that are trying to change us and to make us less self-reliant and more. Very much so and I think the awareness of these contrary dynamics is what gives rise to the theories of dialectic. I mean, Aristotle all the way through history, the variety of them, but they participate in the same way, is essentially asking you for your own self-defense, not to assume that what anyone says especially as they climb the authority ladder, is the truth. Often the misinformation comes from innocent self-delusion, but just as often as you move up the power pyramid, it comes from a malign intent toward your own individuality. So it's like a betrayal of truth that occurs, or you know, a betrayal of, of, of you know, belief in some authority structure that you want to believe in is true, and then little by little you realize that it's not necessarily how it might have been presented to you? Right. Even in your own individual inner life and consciousness, before the cameras rolled, I said, the way I learn what I'm thinking is to write something down that I think I believe and then I argue with it and it never survives. How about that? Now what scares me is that when I go back to it year after year, most of it doesn't survive. I mean, it takes years before I get to a core and I say, I'm not personally capable of moving beyond this, this thing so that we're so well conditioned from infancy uh, not to see the truth or relate the truth but to shave it that the first step in reaching for an education I think is to mistrust what you most are certain of to mistrust that now it may survive but it needs tested not once until you're exhausted from testing it is the school system designed to get kids to grow into a thriving, self-responsible, self-reliant adult? Or is it to whittle away curiosity and to kind of stop them from thinking for themselves? It's certainly not the former in any way for the simple reason that throughout history, management doesn't know how to manage independent units, even partially independent units. Why shouldn't we ask, and any school people uh, watching your, your film should begin immediately to ask politely, why are we doing this? It's a question you never hear because it's heresy. I mean, the beleaguered classroom teacher doesn't know why he or she's doing that. They're told to do it. Maybe they can give it 5% personal spin. That's why they're doing it. Does it make sense for this particular life that's asking you the question? 
you don't know, and if you started to care, the logic of schooling would uh, dissolve. You, the, no one is able. You can answer the question for yourself. I used to say to my classes, and over the course of 30 years teaching, I taught kids from the Gold Coast to the Upper West Side of Manhattan, and I taught kids from the center of Harlem and Spanish Harlem. And I would say to all of them, you have a right at any time, you gotta be polite though, because I'm just human, to say, why are we doing this? And if I can't produce an answer that convinces you that I believe it, then you have a right to opt out and do something else as long as you don't run wild and bring the whole house down. Uh, it, it helped me grow year after year. Not that it, they ask very often because they're conditioned not to do that, but enough did ask that I was put on my own metal to say, why am I doing this? And uh, it was a continual uh, expansion of my own insight until politically I couldn't do it any longer. The school, oddly enough, made me so internally famous that it drew extra attention and my system couldn't survive under the scrutiny because they would see the disparity between what I was doing and what the protocols were. So, so there. So it sounds like uh, the, if I'm trying to get to the root cause of why your teaching career ended, it sounds like you started asking questions, John, and it sounded like the question started with why, with a question mark, and then maybe you were asking some other, like, in you know, the five W's plus how, and you were actually getting observed Constantly knowledge. Answering myself right. questions, then forcing my classes to ask me questions and themselves questions, and eventually, the productive output of my classes was so great, inadvertently, I didn't care how the school measured product, but it was so great that I would get visiting delegations, sometimes on a daily basis, for months, and they would leave baffled because they wouldn't see the drama unfolding that they understood as schooling, and they were right. It was less and less schooling, and eventually the pressure became impossible since I set out at the beginning of the year with an, an inner intention, if I had 120 kids, to have 120 individually written curricula. I never succeeded totally, but I got close enough that when the principal would drop by and only find nine people in class and say, where are the rest, that I ran out of strategies to explain where the rest were. So, so uh, yeah, I couldn't operate. I couldn't function any longer because my physical strength wasn't up to it. So... How did part of the strength of your actual teaching come from releasing children from the classroom and letting them go out in the world and actually gain some useful oh, huge experience? huge amounts of it came from releasing anyone who had an independent course to follow, becoming that boy or girl's assistant, always with the mother's permission because they couldn't deal with that kind of additional political pressure. So what they would learn and bring back would be like food for me. I would be like I was 120 people simultaneously. Oh, I learned much more than I learned at the two Ivy League colleges I attended. I used to say to my wife, and it sounds fanciful, as though, oh, he must love children, which is not true. I, I love people. 
and people can be five years old, but but people who suck their thumb and, and, and rattle and extend childhood school's intention is to artificially extend childhood. And there really is no practical terminus for that. If they can extend it through graduate school and postgraduate. What is the actual reason that their childhoods are being extended? What, how's it serve for the I think what we never discuss, or that the extreme left is preempted to discuss, so they marginalize themselves, is the intimate interrelationship between the economy and the way we train the young. To the extent that we once had a wildly variegated economy, I'm quoting Abraham Lincoln in 1859, famous speech of the Wisconsin Agricultural Association. Lincoln said, I call this mudsill theory because he used that term. L Lincoln said the British are financing the whole Western movement and they're attempting to reinstall their class system. And so they send their young sons over to make sure that not a whole lot of attention is paid to ordinary people or people who live in simple homes that have mud sills. He said they're not, according to the British thinking, they're not worth training or worrying about because there's no way they can possibly improve. Lincoln said, look around you. Three quarters of our population has an independent livelihood and the quarter who doesn't works to put a little stake together to set up on their own and write their own script in life. He said, as a consequence, we don't have proletariat as they do in Britain and Germany and, and the European nations, and we aren't able to have a factory system where it exists in this country, which is in New England, in the textile industries, a factory will have 30 or 40 employees. They'll usually be young women waiting marriage, they'll be served tea at their machines, and they'll be opera performances stage for just to keep them at the machine. Because these independent livelihoods lead to, you know, totally private independent systems of value. So the British are wrong, but of course, the Civil War changed that. We're sold that it was a great crusade against slavery by the school system. The major historians who've turned their attention to that say, I mean, to a person, that slavery was already dead. It was staggering through its last couple of generations, not because of a moral transfer, transformation on the part of plantation owners, but because the wives of the plantation owners were scratching their head and saying, you know, the boss, my husband vanishes for a couple of days. We have all these new slaves and they're not black anymore. They're various shades of brown. So they, he, he, I'm thinking right now, I think Vern Parrington, but a, a number of historians 50 years ago said slavery was on its last legs because the southern womanhood wouldn't stand for it any longer. Uh, Russia, I believe, had freed the serfs. Uh, Britain and the continent had done this thing. We were going to do it too. But it gave a nobility to the necessity to get rid of the southern politicians 
who were trained in dialectical thinking, in rhetoric, and could run circles around the northern politicians in Congress. They could produce the most compelling arguments for this or that. And so the South had to be gotten rid of. From my understanding, those dry goods like cotton from the South that were produced by slaves were then going to you know, factories in the North. And the factory owners in the North figured out that the, the slave owners were paying too much overhead. It cost a lot to keep a whole oh. family fed, et cetera. And there sure. were letters exchanged, and they actually discovered it was cheaper. Why not make everyone uh, a, a slave who doesn't know that they're a slave? A wage slave. Right, right. And, and think, think only about the welfare idea, if you have a plantation family and you require harmony, even though some people are very subordinate, if somebody gets sick or too old to work, you can't, in fact, do the Simon Legree bit and get rid of them, or what happens is morale collapses. So you have to care for them. The discussions on the highest level among northern industrialists was why should we have to why should we have to support Deadwood here? And we could do that if they were wage slaves. Yeah, yeah. The and, and, and furthermore, people like uh Count Tolstoy was well aware of the hardcore underneath the romantic arguments, and so were a number of other people. But the public dependent upon media and pulpits, which were subsidized by the owners, could they couldn't find a zone where they could think clearly, or someone would say, yeah, here's the truth. Think about it. Early forms of mass media propaganda by from the pulpit or the newspaper. Well, the Chautauquas. Sure, right. Oh, absolutely. The Chautauquas were put together by intense... The, the family that uh, began Harper's Publishers and had the very prestigious journal of the time, Harper's Weekly... Uh, Louis Lapham, the Lapham family. Well, was Lapham's a very latter his day. Dad, his his grandfather was in charge of Harper's, though, and yeah. he was mayor of San Francisco, I believe. Mayor, he was uh, when the UN uh, came in, and he he told me that uh, his boyhood was filled with foreign dignitaries yeah. in the home. His house guests were putting the throne back glass of wine, so you can actually trace the small number of families behind the Chautauquas, which were the most compelling mass media of the day. And you'd hear about what was going on in Boston, out in Cincinnati, and you'd want that. And selectively, ideas and ways of thinking were introduced to the best people, and they used their local prestige to make sure that, you know, it's a, a natural process. So, so what we got was a second American Revolution between, oh, I don't know, 1865 and about 1910. This time the British won again, but they didn't win by force of arms, but by force of insight into the way opinion is created. And when the skilled workers who had intense pride and really were the key to the prosperity of uh, early industrial operation, commercial operation, when the skilled workers understood their power, then industry and commerce were mechanized intensely and you wiped out the need for skill. You took less quality, but now you had less contention, less argument. Carnegie was, uh, was instrumental in eliminating the, the influence of skilled labor, and it continued right through the 20th century. What influence have the Rockefellers had on organized labor, skilled labor, education? 
the the Rockefeller family can actually be traced way back in Dutch history. There's a an ancestor of the Rockefellers who set up a rather detailed plan for global government hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And that is one of these flow charts that showed how you were going to do that or not. But uh, or the great irony, of course, is that Rockefeller and Carnegie's families were fringe people in the United States but using their using their brilliant insight into leverage and how it works both were able to take nothing and pyramid it into quite a bit Rockefeller actually his uh, father I believe but it may have been his grandfather fled a rape charge, sort of like Strauss Kahn's up in Bainbridge, New York. He had been charged with rape of a maid and fled. They threw their, uh, a Rockefeller threw their weight behind, this is it's emblematic of how they were, behind Horatio Alger, who also had been charged with rape up here in Connecticut, and the Newsboys Lodging House. And if you read a wonderful book that exists, uh, a limited edition, but it's kept continuously in print, called The, uh, the Rise of the Dangerous Classes in New York City by the creator of American Adoption. When I started to research school, I kept running into the same people who put the adoption institution together and the school institute, one much more important than the other, but still the same names float in and out of one another. Charles Loring Brace, who I believe his father was the publisher of the Hartford Courant. I'm almost sure in his early diaries say, I must find a way to become nationally famous. I mean, in Yale, he wrote that he didn't have any idea how he was going to do that. But finally, it occurred to him that with these masses of immigrants being brought in to break the Irish labor monopoly in the mines and the mills, that the easiest way to lower the unit cost of labor was to bring the husband and the wife into the labor force. You double the size of the labor force, you cut the unit value of the labor in half. But you couldn't do that as long as they were worried about their kids. So now you have the impetus to enlarge the social work industry, to corrupt the legislatures, to give it the power to break families apart, and what do you do with the kids? Well, the expression put up for adoption tells you you don't want them anywhere in the neighborhood. You want them far away. So you put them in boxcars. This great secret, monstrous event in American history that goes on for 40, 50 years. Boxcars full of the children of the labor sent west. They started upstate New York, but that was too close. So they kept going farther and farther west. And then they'd stop at a whistle stop and a platform would be brought out. The boxcar would open. The children would be put up for adoption. They had a preference for who they wanted to adopt. They wanted Lutherans to adopt because they had the Episcopal idea of hierarchy, but they were just dumb farmers. They couldn't think clearly. Here was free labor, hey, and that will, that will end the future uh, career of these immigrants. What stopped 
putting children up for adoption was the police chiefs of the West. I think the year was 1888, but give me a few years either way. They wrote a stinging attack on this practice, not on moral grounds, but they said crime is everywhere in the West. And if you go to the uh, psychological abstracts, you'll find that an enormous number of adopted children, for example, six of the ten leading mass murderers in American history, but all forms of crime, because when you break the bond with the natural, you can't put substitutes in place. Again, not morally. There's a recent uh, physiological theory called mere neurons that you learn to use your own biological equipment by watching people who have the same or nearly identical biological. When you remove that, even if the family that you're transferred to has money and savoir faire and civil, they're more civil, doesn't matter. You're actually imitating things that your physiology can accommodate. As a consequence, you get incrementally more and more crazed inside and angry. Uh, one of the things, of course, school does is it prevents these kind of connections between different areas from occurring. That's what the short answer test is about. And Oxford and Cambridge got rid of it a hundred years ago. A hundred years ago because they said people who do well on short answer tests, they memorize bits of information, but they don't connect the bits of information. And when they seem to be able to connect the bits of information, it's because they've memorized someone else's connections. The better the school, the more sets of connections you memorize. But you can't do that for yourself. You know, it's, it's like these machines where you guys are all too young to remember. They used to sell machines that would relieve the stress of lifting weights. You'd put the weight in your hand, but the machine would lift your arm in the way. Only trouble was, your muscle knew the difference. But the people buying the machinery didn't. Well, it looks exactly the same. Anyway, I, I, I put me back on course here. Is there any connection between frustration and aggression? And what effect does schooling have on that. Well, you, you, I mean, you answer your own question by asking it. I mean, the connection's intimate. School removes your volition in all important ways. Even who you speak to are not the arts of association as valuable or more valuable than anything else you learn when you're young. I read how executive hiring is done, and it almost never has to do with your training in whatever you're being hired for. It's, is this the kind, I'm, I'm thinking of Apple now, I believe. Is this the person we would like to have around three years from now? and bend an elbow with, or play golf with, or just talk with. I mean, and that's why you're passed from set of executives to set of executives, so they can sign off, yeah, he's okay, you know, we can... Uh, but we don't tell kids that, right? It's people who have the highest grade point average and the highest... Uh, SAT scores. Well, I spent an hour, years, well, not so long ago, within 10 years, with the admissions officer for Harvard College, and about 30 years ago, an hour with the admissions director at Princeton. And let me tell you, their polite dismissal of grades and SAT scores was intimidating to listen to, as if 
you'd have to be crazy to let somebody in. Let me see if I can uh, condense how you get into Harvard or Princeton. Of course, you get into both by donating a building, but, but how do other people get in? They're being analyzed on the basis of their ability to either become wealthy or famous. Either one will work. Famous, like wearing a billboard saying, I went, went to Princeton. There's that actress Jodie Foster, I went to Princeton. Look at where the rest of the actors and directors went. They didn't go anywhere, <laughs> but Jodie did. So that's the one we hear about. Uh, it's... The Harvard lady said, we look for a record of excellence. And what does excellence consist of? It's sometime in the first 18 years of your life, figuring out how to add value to the people around you. Although she didn't say this, in a way that catches public attention. So you might walk across the United States or bicycle the perimeter of the country or row across the Atlantic Ocean as a physical way. You might start a little charity or set up some weather service or some pollution monitoring around uh, Hartford. There, there are a substantial number, a small fraction, but a substantial number of kids doing this as we sit here. They're writing a record of being able to add value to the community around them. And then the other fellow, the, the Princeton guy, said the same thing in different words. I asked him, what is about 68, roughly? I asked him, what part of a resume submitted? you look at first and when, the answer metaphorically caused my jaw to open hobbies he said I said I've been taught all my life leave that off because it's not germane he said on the contrary it's the only honest information you're likely to get how does someone spend their time when it's their free choice to spend? He said it's a window into their mind and their heart. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what kind of hobbies? He said, well, ideally someone would have a physical hobby, an intellectual hobby, and a social hobby, because that would show they're exploring these large well, physical hobby, you mean football, baseball. Well, he said, it's better than nothing, but we would prefer not to see teams. As I've been told all my life, the team sports identify your ability to work in a team. He said, what happens in a team sport is if you decide to dog it, it's very hard to tell which guy on the line has docked it or not, or which running back has gone down quicker than he should have gone down there. He said, we prefer uh, solo hobbies that involve physical danger. You mean you want kids to put their necks at rent? For example, what? I said, he said, well, Horseback riding is a dead giveaway. The horse weighs a half a ton or more. Uh, if you do trail riding, you don't know what you're doing. Your head gets caught on a branch, and, and you're the headless horseman. If the horse doesn't like you, it'll roll over on top of you, and I know immediately, because that last time I rode a horse was down in Veracruz, Mexico, the horse didn't like me. Took me out on the main highway with crazed Mexican drivers going 100 miles an hour and 18 wheelers, and it laid down on top of me. I was terrified because I could see these trucks coming. Didn't like that was the last time I rode. 
So he said, you have to actually know what you're doing. You can't say, is this an A job or a B job if you live and are intact to this. Then he said, sailing a small boat, these little 12-footers outside of land, uh, if you don't know what you're doing, you end up in the middle of the Atlantic, you know, or, you, or, or if wind comes up, you can't see landmarks because of the waves. Uh, I said, but those things are associated with uh, the prosperous classes. What, what could somebody in ordinary circumstances do? He said, well, we just let somebody in. This is probably one of the nicest factoids in my mind, in my life. We just let someone in who invented his own sport and kept records competing against himself, his past performance, his present performance. It was, get ready for this, visualize this, seatless unicycle riding over broken terrain. If I had 10 lifetimes, the thought of doing that wouldn't occur. I started getting on a unicycle, let alone one without a seat, let alone riding it over broken terrain. So they let him in because they knew he was on the fast track. <laughs> so, so we tell these lies, and of course many of the people who tell the lies believe the lies. Well, surely they're going to take valedictorians. Well, last year Harvard turned down eight out of every ten valedictorians who applied, and the two they took in, they didn't take in because they were valedictorians there. So by, by removing this component from the student imagination, you can control to some extent who even applies to Harvard and then who gets in, who, who applies, because they don't know what they're doing. What's the IT garbage in, garbage out? So what I would do was I would examine. I have a friend who started a tutoring service called the Princeton Review and Oh, 20 years ago, they were charging $300 an hour. I have no idea what they charge now. But what they did was crack the code of the questions on standardized tests. And he, Adam Robinson was his name. Adam took his money and left the Princeton Review to his partner. Uh, but Adam has written a book well worth, I think, your group looking up called What Smart Students Know, Random House, What Smart Students Know. Uh, Adam was certain that you could pass standardized tests without having any knowledge of the, the subject as long as you understood the constraints, the test, the question, architects were under. For example, two of the four answers offered are always so absurd that if you know that, now you're left with a 50-50 guess. I had figured out when I was in high school that if you had some way to measure the angles on the little uh, geometric figures on the test that you didn't need to know. You could arrive at the answer simply by, you know, a simplistic means. Uh, the evidence that all of us know, standardized tests, don't measure what they claim to measure, is that nobody, I mean nobody you encounter on the upper reaches of society would dream of hiring somebody on the basis of those tests or in grade point averages. You'd be playing Russian roulette because they measure nothing. The grades largely measure 
that you memorize what you're told to memorize. I mean, there are a few other things, but that's the heart of it. So now you know you have somebody obedient, and probably for a clerk, that is a good manager. Not for someone who has to adapt to changing circumstances, you know, by the natural selection process of reality. Uh, it, it, it's fairly easy without being a wise guy or very learned as long as you retain the ability to think independently from the data in front of you to penetrate the masks, the contentions that don't conform to everyday reality. So no one will hire you as a CEO and ask you what you're saying. But, but if you examine the, uh, the data that's available about big time politicians, now we have, and I don't think it surprised anybody, that George Bush, the most recent one, was a C average in high school, prep school, and a C average at Yale. What does surprise people is that the candidate he ran against was a C average in prep school and a C average at Yale and a lower C average than George Bush's and the Kerry of Massachusetts. The fact that the, the, the best evidence that the nation has been schooled to the point of extinction is that they were fraternity brothers at Yale in a fraternity, I'll skip its interesting reputation, it only has 15 members. And they were fraternity brothers at Yale. There's 308 million of us. I mean, mathematically, I wouldn't know how to set the odds, but they would be stupendous. No one mentioned it, or if they did, it was to quickly get over that. That should have been headlines with the New York Times and the Washington Post. Fraternity Brothers at Yale run for president. You wouldn't need to mention that it was the Skull and Bones fraternity. So when the skew from sanity is that of that magnitude, you should not expect much to come from the watchdogs of, of our liberty and our best interests. How could that happen unless but there's a, a Jewish expression, chutzpah, unless this feeling of contempt for ordinary people was very dramatic. We could, I'm sure someone in the council who allowed that to happen said, maybe someone will notice. To dismiss that shows you how powerless to believe, for example, another example, that the recent banking crisis, you know, the real estate bubble, the, uh, it is an oddity in American banking. There have been five such since 1961 savings and loan technology bubble. There have been five of those, and the central figure in all five is the Citibank of New York. Now, sometimes it's called First National. That's back in 61. Then it becomes Citibank. Then it merges with another huge court, and it becomes Citigroup. But the mentality loose on that level shows utter contempt for the safeguards built into, you know, the founding documents or built into tradition as ordinary people, and that includes upper middle class ordinary people, expect it to be. It doesn't exist. Now, what we've run into 
is a people infinitely more sophisticated than us with a 5,000 year civilization who are even more amoral than we are and look at starving 3 million people to death as they did 20 years ago, is there any shortage of people? I mean, they're already running circles. I've spoken in China half a dozen times for various groups, and the Chinese government is a little bit worried, not a lot, that their system of schooling, very like ours, except more disciplined, uh, it seems to constrain the inventive imagination. The reason they're not worried is they don't recognize copyright law or patent law, so they have access to anything there. But they will not accept they keep asking me by. They will not accept that the system they're applying to the young mind is guaranteed to foreclose the imagination that produces invention. So I mean, I'm happy to take their money and get a chance to see uh, uh, Xi'an and Shanghai and Beijing, but they will follow the course we find. It'll just take a little bit longer, that's all. Your turn. In China, they have the outcome-based education system, but they're seeking to tweak it so that they can, they can kind of improve it. They said, we want to keep our people under control, but we want them to be more creative and productive and efficient and happy while they're doing it, yes. right? Now, the question is, if America has become more incoherent, wouldn't that be a function of the Prussian education system, outcome-based education being used to control the workers and make more profits, and now it's just run its course. The, uh, it's run its course. We're exhausted now. Our schooling is exhausted, and the national vitality's been exhausted. The, uh, I'm glad you used uh, the term incoherence. About three or four years ago, the Financial Times of London on the editorial page, accused us of being an inco. You may have read the same piece I did, an incoherent society that we had lost a reason to be a nation at all, because subsidizing bankers and drug companies wasn't a sufficient reason to proceed in history. Yeah, we're incoherent. We don't, nation comes from the root uh, family. And, and we, we no longer have a concern other than a rhetorical concern with one another. I mean, obviously, there are many individual exceptions to that. But the government clearly has no such concern. We have evolved an economy that depends upon constant warfare. And even though it was stretching it in Iraq and Afghanistan, when those are over, we must have another conflict. We're going to have to stretch it even further. And maybe attack small islands, Fiji maybe, because they represent a menace. Being a child of World War II, the idea of calling something a war where the enemy has no army, navy, air force, intelligence service, where they blow up their feet in their underwear, it just stretches the bounds of the ridiculous to call it a war. Uh, but we we got a we got an object lesson from uh, oh, a television comedian who said when you fly planes into a building it certainly shows you have courage and that was temporarily the end of his career you do not speak in opposition to the main. Forced driving events. 
Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, to look at to look at America between, let me roughly say, eighteen hundred and eighteen sixty five, and then from momentum right up to the First World War, there's this explosion of invention, and it comes from the unlikeliest places. It does not come from university-trained inventors. It comes from everywhere. It's the way people saw the world around them. They saw this raw, the elements, the raw material. They processed it a slightly different way, and then they had the expands the rhetorical capacity to say, hey, look, there's a better way to do this. It was happening so frequently that a crisis occurred in capitalism. And without understanding this crisis, you really can't understand why our schools are the product of the Rockefeller family, the Carnegie family, the Astor family, the Vanderbilt family, the great capitalist families. They understood that the real problem in successful capitalism is assembling capital, getting people to give you their savings on the promise that you'll give them more back. But if you have people in a, an inventive matrix who can look at the way the expensive business is doing things, open up across the street and either do it cheaper or better or simply open up somewhere else where no one is doing it, capital is always at great risk. So in or, oddly enough, I don't want to claim credit for what really is a brilliant insight, but I want to crave credit. It was openly discussed, let me say, from 1880 to 1900. We were being forcibly converted from an economy of small farmers, small engineers, entrepreneurs, into a corporate economy. And these men doing it, they weren't intellectual dumb coughs. They could see that as long as the American inventiveness was loose like a wild beast, they were going to have a lot of trouble pulling characters. Someone would say, but I saw, you know, Jack, and he went belly up. So Prussian schooling, which had, for a different reason, had been out to destroy the imagination. And let me say to anyone listening to this, when someone makes a reckless statement like that, you make sure they can document it. And I will document it as long as you're willing to walk to your local public library. Because in every public library worth its salt in the United States and in every college library, you will find a collection of essays by a Prussian philosopher, Johann Fichte, who was the immediate heir to the University of Berlin's philosophy department, which had been under Immanuel Kant. Fichte wrote a series of, it was over a dozen public essays to the Prussian king from, let's say, let me say, 1808 to about 1818. They're called Addresses to the German Nation. And the provocative event that set the first one off was the Prussian army, which was the Prussian economy, renting soldiers, stealing other people's stuff, had been whipped by Napoleon's amateur army at the Battle of Vienna in 1806. And Fichte said it was because this demon imagination was loose among ordinary soldiers and in situations they would override the orders from headquarters about what to do and that's why we lost. Now what should fascinate anyone listening is 
That's exactly what the so-called liberal philosopher uh, Spinoza in Holland had said in 1690 in a book called Tractatus Politico Re Religico Politicus. Tractatus Religico Politicus. Spinoza said that the ordinary population was so psychologically diseased, murderously so, there was no way to heal it. Just as Ficht, 125 years later, said there was no way to heal the disobedience gene in people who thought for themselves. Fichte said we have to set up a system of forced schooling, universal forced schooling, in which we destroy the imagination. Bells, ordered lessons, constant testing, rankings. Now, if it were only those two major figures, but you now can go back a few hundred years in history to John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is this thick, tiny print. But if you ever go mad and actually force yourself to read it, rather than to read what an encyclopedia tells you it says, you'll find that Calvin says that the saved are saved before they're born the damned, who are 19 to 1, are damned before they're born, and no amount of good work or behavior can save the damned, and no amount of evil behavior can damn the saved. The expression that used to be pretty common, but has vanished, I think, on purpose, is justified sinners. The saved are justified sinners who can do anything. They can carpet bomb civilian populations, whether they're Nazis or Americans. You know, you've done no harm, according to Calvin. Calvin said the only way the, the elect, he called the same, the elect will be ever be safe because they're outnumbered so heavily, is to set up a system of universal compulsion, schooling, with the intention of destroying the imagination and filling the head with garbage. Spinoza said the same thing. Fichte said the same thing. So, I think we, we just ran out of tape. Is that what happened? Is yeah, that one still running? You're, you're, yes, it's but it has no mic room. Yeah. All right. So we're going to take uh, a 10 minute break. Oh, good. We're going to change the tapes. We're going to turn all these lights out. We're going to turn the AC back on and cool you off. If you want to get up and move around, use the bathroom. Major minds with a lot of influence who... Can I have you hold that spot? Oh, sure. All right, roll cameras. See, this is what happens when you got real talent. It just goes. Four cameras rolling. Red dots, everybody? Cool. Four is yours. So we have this ominous continuity among major minds with a lot of influence, including transatlantic influence on the states. We have, prior to the break, Fichte in Prussia, Spinoza in Holland, and Calvin really beginning in Geneva and spreading all over where where his theology spread. But the father of this, at least in the form of written documentation that's easily available, has to be Plato, the Greek aristocrat who speaks through the mouth of Socrates and writes two influential utopias, one well-known, 
the republic, and one not so well known, the laws, which is the product of his mature reflection on what needs to be done. And all four of these men, and we could if we had time, do 40, but these four major names spanning European history agree that the ordinary population is A, very dangerous to the social order if it learns how to think and if its imagination remains intact. And furthermore, we have this corollary that there is no way to improve this. And what I've left out is the killer app that occurs in the middle to the end of the 19th century from one of the wealthiest families on planet Earth, the family of Charles Darwin and their former Anglican minister trained son, Charles who in his second major publication, The Descent of Man, says that the evolutionarily retarded are fatally dangerous to the physical integrity of the human race, the advance of civilization, because of the few evolutionarily advanced, like the Scandinavian blondes and the English blondes, crossbreed, God forbid, with the Irish or the Spanish, evolution will march backwards into the swirling mists of the dawnless past, and nothing can change that. Maybe a few million years might change it. Certainly nothing that current generations can do. Darwin, of course, is in every school, including every elementary school in the United States, probably the world, and no one bothers to mention that he doesn't say the human race is evolving. There's a few, a fraction are evolving. Now, put yourself if you're watching this, in the position of a responsible person who learns that. As someone who's made worldly success, has a little bit of time on their hands and resources, and now you know that if these ordinary people walking around in the American democracy, if they happened, if they happen to crossbreed with your daughter, evolution is going to march backwards. You now have a justification beginning in 1871, second to none. You can argue with Calvin. You can argue with Spinoza. You can argue with Plato. You can argue with Fichte. This is science and mathematics. And furthermore, and an unknown connection that has for some reason escaped the attention of the Darwinians. Darwin's earlier cousin, Thomas Malthus, has said there is no way mathematically to feed the poor because if you feed them, They'll reproduce more successfully, and then there'll be twice as many, then four times as many. That population expands geometrically, but food only arithmetically. So we, and, and of course, in Darwin's diaries, he said that his pursuit of the secrets of biology are stimulated by the work of his. Cousin Malthus. Now we have, after Darwin's two blockbusters, the second of which. I'm going to raise my hand from now on. Yeah. What's the full name of Darwin's Origin of Species? The, the progress of the favored races. And he does not use the term race the way we do. 
he recognized about 57 separate races, of which the Irish are on the very bottom. Thank goodness he said that, because a respectable percentage of every audience I speak to, that you'd otherwise be reluctant to say these things to, is derived from, anybody here derived from a partial Irish background. <laughs> you, you know, he said the Irish are hopeless. There is no hope for the Irish. Uh, of course, what's left out of simply relating what Darwin said is his training as an Anglican minister. And if you happen to pick up the Anglican Book of Common Prayer, hundreds and hundreds of years preceding Darwin, you find that God's will is to divide all the living creatures and plants into an infinite number of layers and to attempt to leave the layer you're placed in is the worst sacrilege at all. So that Darwin's theory fully explicated is the Anglican homily of obedience. Homily of Obedience says exactly what Darwin says hundreds of years ago. Don't try to get out of your biological category because it's hopeless. And prior to that, don't try to get out of your spiritual category because it's hopeless. There's a great similarity between the two ideas. Now if you set out to find evidence that this is so it's much easier than simply setting out to look at the you know the abundance of natural forms so the real actor in the piece darwin's a shy man fantastically wealthy that's been left out of all the fantastically wealthy the high tech upper class purchase of the day was Wedgwood pottery, and that's the source of the Darwin family wealth. So Darwin's first cousin is a man I was taught in high school back in the early 1950s, is estimated to be the most intelligent single human being ever lived. I was told that over and over. His name, Francis Galton, a world-famous explorer, mathematician, inventing little statistical formulae to discriminate shades of quality that the schools are infested with. And he has Mr. Galton, a worldwide following of Galton clubs, including in the United States, he makes several pilgrimages to the U.S. to spread the insight that a menace to the human race exists in 95% of the population, and there has to be a way to put them, render them harmless. School, recommended by Fichte, Spinoza, Calvin, and Plato, that's the way to do it, and we'll defend this with precise mathematical signs. We will keep to ourselves the biological reason. Meanwhile, we've got to find a way for the biologically advanced to breed with one another. If you will trace the founding years of the elite private boarding schools in the United States, with the exception of no more than six, you will discover that all of the male and female emerge in the 30, including the women's colleges, the seven sisters, in the 30 years after the descent of man, which will be in every respectable library in the United States, and of course overseas too. I urge you, especially if you're Irish, 
to pick it up and read it. <laughs> you will not be disappointed to find yourself at the bottom of all the races on earth. <laughs> Just as the English without Darwin would have agreed. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, anyway, so this package of high-level evidences, contentions, is capstone with scientific mathematical evidence and the proselytizing of Francis Galton. Vigorous, rigorous. Out of that comes in the period right after the American First World War, a phenomenon in country fairs all over America called the Better Families Competitions. You set up the criteria for ranking and you know, you present your daughters like prize heifers to be rated by the judges. So we have a series of these reinforcements of Darwinian theory, which is really a reinforcement of Anglican theology or Calvinist theology, or Platonic philosophy, or Fichtean philosophy, or if you want to go liberal, uh, of uh, Spinozan philosophy, until finally we get to this cap. So now the cap is off the tunnel to hell, because not only are people justified in setting up a form of schooling, that's anti-educational, but they're doing either nature's work or the Lord's work. You decide. You want to go Calvin, you're doing the Lord's work. You want to go nature, you go... Spinoza. Yeah, yeah. So the, all of this wonderfully rich fabric of foundation is right on the surface. Someone has to point your attention to it. Please, no one watching say, oh, this fellow Gatto has spun off, you know, this phenomenal, interesting, but wacky theory. I didn't spin off anything. I took the dots and I connected them. And I said, they're identical from 300 BC until post Darwin Galton comes a German, a, a Prussian uh, psychophysicist named Wilhelm Wundt, who is the premier behavioral psychologist on earth. And now let me spring a bombshell on all of you. The only place in the world for a long, long time, you could get a PhD degree, was either Prussia, University of Berlin, Leipzig, these little nest of Germanic countries. So from all over the world came the sons of the most powerful families, beginning in 1814 or 16 in the United States, when a guy who later became the governor of Massachusetts went over to get his PhD degree. By the 1870s, 1880s, it was a flood from Japan, from Russia, from everywhere. And now they return to their home countries, not because they have a PhD degree or they made presidents of universities, heads of government, Bureau, because their families have clout, and now that's become the ticket to intellectual management. That's how these Prussian ideas spread like wildfire. There's only one university in the United States who doesn't have a president with a Prussian PhD, and he's close. I think he has a a French PhD, because the French scrambled to try to get that degree too. That's Titchener at Cornell, or the head of a, all, the, all the heads of psych departments, Prussian PhDs. So you now get this kernel of 
ideas, whether fanciful or scientific, everywhere. From Japan, I mean, everywhere are the same ideas. The Japanese Constitution in 1868 is scrapped, and the Prussian Constitution translated into Japanese. I mean, we're talking here the domination of ideas that's so interesting that what should make you suspicious is that no one ever heard of They heard of this detail, this detail. Why hasn't anyone joined them together? Well, I'll tell you what, a big shot professor at Columbia Teachers College told me 12 years ago when I bearded him in his den and I said, Doug, surely you know these things. What? Why is a junior high school teacher left to beat the drink? He looked at me and he said, not a good way to get tenure. That's all he said, and I knew. I knew that financial, finally, prize or penalty is enough to control the way we all think. And these things have been studied since the Collegia in ancient Rome. Armies have put together these insights. Churches have put together these insights and passed them down in an unbroken string to their sons, usually. And of course, the daughters catch as catch can, but eventually to both. If I could notice the pattern that you're describing, it seems that people are irrational. They come up with ideas of utopias, and then they, in order to get this utopia, compulsory schooling. And then they found a bunch of different ways, in the latest, using science to make people think that this is how it has to be. But when you look at the, uh, you know, the real effects of Darwin in the form of, uh, say, eugenics, and the role it played oh, in America. That's Gal Galton is the inventor. His first cousin is the inventor of eugenics and the chief global distributor. There's one major exception to this, and the people who claim to be a follower of the exception claim to have read his book like the Bible have never seen him say what I'm about to say. I'm talking about the so-called father of capitalism, the, the, the wealth of nations, Adam Smith, who in the first 15 pages says there's no difference between the Duke's son and the street sweeper's son except early training a dead giveaway that this idea was known to be highly dangerous. And I don't think this has ever occurred in publishing that I know of before or since. In the 1809 reprint of Wealth of Nations, because it immediately became an international must-read, the publisher of the book, a man with the ironic name of William Playfair, an economist, takes his own author to task in the preface to the book. He said the social order would be destroyed by telling people that they were all capable of intellectual development. The only way we've progressed through thousands of years of history is to make them think they depend on our good will, uh, you know, for their bread and butter, let alone their safety and everything else. It's a scathing upbraid of his own immortal author, Adam Smith. But Smith is, as far as I can see, other than minor figures like Florence Nightingale, and I'm not even sure about her, he's the only one who says what ought to be obvious on the face of it. It became obvious to me 
when I was given five classes a day to teach in the middle of Manhattan's Gold Coast of the Upper West Side. So I taught the, the sons and daughters of the media darlings and the sons and daughters of the professoriate and, and the doctors and lawyers, but I also taught the kids from Spanish Harlem and from Black Harlem who never eaten off a tablecloth in their life, nor was I raised with a very democratic outlook. It wasn't an undemocratic outlook, but it wasn't stress. So you could hardly call my family in modern terms liberal, although I hope we'll discuss that's not a dirty word at all. It's what you ought to be aiming to be. And because my German grandfather, who cried out in the middle of the street in Mon City for German victory during the Second World War, even though his son was an infantry commander at the Battle of the Bulge, but he was calling for German victory. Uh, let me see if I can, if I can tone down my enthusiasm for, for well, a large percentage of the population at the time at the time was german oh and right was now a, there was a whole swing of you know pro german up until like 1913 and then all of a sudden uh, the germans uh -huh. were huns and ad hominem uh -huh. attacks right adolf hitler in my, the reason you don't find mein kampf everywhere isn't that it's a dull book there's a center section that's a tribute to the United States as the most pure Germanic country on earth. The 10 foot portrait of Henry Ford behind Hitler's desk and Sigmund Freud's nephew. Bernays. Edward L. Bernays was the public relations man for Nazi Germany. <laughs> That's why you don't find that would disturb people to know. So best they don't know that stuff. Anyway, I uh, partly out of uh, a kind of natural egalitarianism that comes from a strong working class population around Pittsburgh who will break your nose if you insult them rather than beg for mercy. Uh, I decided, and partly because of laziness, I decided with my five classes a day to impose the same material on all five classes, the same quality of discourse, make no differentiation at all. Certainly made my life easier. But what I had done was throw away the assigned curriculum, which I believe was Jack London, and, and, and nothing wrong with Jack London, I mean, a lot of fun to read, but if you want to exercise your mental muscles, that's not the way to go. And I had taken from Cornell and Columbia and Reed College in Oregon, which are the major colleges I attended, I had taken a level of uh, text fully equal to that. And what I discovered was, apart from cosmetic differences, maybe a little less grammatical, maybe shorter papers and stuff, that the level of intellect in the ghetto black population and the ghetto Hispanic population was really quite equal to the others. That wasn't a political belief I wanted to impose. Let me give you one example. I had a little black kid named Gregory Smith. Gregory, I hope somehow or other you're alive and you're listening to this. And I'm replacing Jack London with Moby Dick, the most difficult American novel ever written that explores all the great ideas of European history, predestination, and all the rest. And I'm holding forth on those ideas at the same time we're reading a book that's way beyond anything in difficulty they've ever read. 
and I hear a crash. I look, and Gregory Smith has fallen asleep and crashed to the floor. Well, I'm fresh out of Pittsburgh, and the way we deal with people like that is to kick them with the soles of their feet. They wake up real quick. That's the way the cops do to us when we're making out under cars around <laughs> Pittsburgh. And if our feet stick out, they kick our feet. So anyway, Gregory wakes up, and I'm very insulting, and he said, I don't need to pay attention. I learned that stuff in third grade. We're in eighth grade now. So I'm really insulting, but I say, what do you mean you learned that in third grade? He said, well, I learned that there are these sets of ladies who weave your future and you can't change it. Either the Norns in Scandinavia or the Fates in Greece. And as I was reeling back from that, because he'd made a connection Cornell and Columbia never made for me between predestination and these, he said, and, and I learned these things from the visiting science teacher called genes and chromosomes, and they did dictate the color of your hair and how you scratch your nose. You can't change that. So I don't need to listen to you talk about predestination. Well, at that minute, I mean, at that exact second, I said, this kid has written a PhD thesis that will become a book. You know, that will make his living for the rest of his life. And he's Gregory Smith, a stupid kid. Yeah, you know, and then I completely opened my eyes, and sure enough, behind the street idiom was active mentality, you know, fresh ideas. It just had been treated with such disrespect for so many years, it wasn't worth bothering to waste it on a school teacher. It revolutionized my teaching, but then over the balance of the, that was the first year I taught, of the 29 years I taught, I decided to use the fresh eyes and perspectives of the so-called hopeless ghetto kids, and huge benefits flowed to me, and I hope some to them, too, because I took what they wanted to do seriously. If Jamal Watson wanted to do nothing but draw comic books in the back of the class, I would go back and use my superior experience, not intelligence, to say, listen, Jamal, I used to read comic books, and if you want to do this seriously, you're doing it wrong. He'd get angry and say, I'm the best in the school. I said, yeah, maybe, I said. But in a real comic book, all the panels aren't the same size. Look at the one you're copying from. They're all different sizes to show movement. And in a real comic book, the figures don't stay inside of the body. The head comes out, the fist comes out. I said, look, you're copying, and you don't see that. Why don't you take a week out of school, go to the local public library, I'll cover for you, take down a stack of books on graphic art, and learn what you're doing. I mean, that's a worthwhile use of your time. So I found out that each person, one girl wanted to do nothing but swim, and she snored in class. And when I finally said to her, what's going on? She said, I've devoted my life to being an Olympic swimmer. She's 13. And I said, well, why don't you do that for the rest of the year? You can't do it in school. We don't have a swimming pool. But there are about 150 public swimming pools in New York City. Why don't you plot them out on a map with pins or stickers, visit every one of them, set up a rating for these swimming pools. 
concentration of chemicals in the water, depth of the pool, length of the line, lighting, access, cost, and you will produce an information reference that will make you somebody, because I'll go around to the local public library and say you're doing that, and could you be cataloged? Because who else has such a reference as this? Well, she was. Her life was transformed because I treated her time and her with respect. But meanwhile, if you took any, I mean any of the subject areas, you could find that she was developing muscles in, in each one of them. We got a call from New York. That's a city magazine in New York, about midway through the school year and they said they had heard about this and they wanted to buy the data and they would pay five hundred dollars for it i said you mean you want to publish your art? well no we would put our own writer's name on it this girl i doubt if she'd ever seen a ten dollar bill in her life i'm offering her five hundred dollars she said no it's mine if they want to use it they'll put my name on it, which they weren't willing to do. So, but but I know that was the beginning of a transformation in her life. A famous American writer, somebody that uh, the uh, New York senator from Harvard, what was his name? A fruity voice, uh, very famous one. Uh, go back ten years. Who am I talking about? He wrote. No, prior to that, but he coincided with Cuomo. No, he was, uh, uh, he had written books about uh, the plight of poverty, but they weren't sympathetic books. He was nationally famous, and he was so florid as a, a public figure that, uh, ah. in any case, I had a friend who had flunked out of uh, Cornell. I'm, I'm reluctant to mention his name without because he's a nationally famous writer about assassinations. And this famous New York senator said publicly that he was the world's foremost assassination expert. Well, you now know that he was a flunk out from Cornell. So how did this happened because when he saw the Kennedy assassination, I had driven him to Cornell and he was trying to plead his way back in. And Kennedy was assassinated. We stayed up all night. We both agreed if anything happened to the assassin that none of the information could be trusted in the next morning or afternoon. And that was it for the assassin. So he went back to Cornell as a flunk out, talked a big time professor, Andrew Hacker, whose dad started the general studies program at Columbia, into giving him a PhD or the beginning of one without ever going to class. He would spend all his time writing a book about the, not the Kennedy assassination, about the composition of the Warren Commission, which I thought was a very clever way to sidestep, you know, all the, you know, yellow journalism stuff. It became, Inquest it was called, it became a national bestseller. It led to an all expenses paid PhD at Harvard. Then he wrote a book about the De Beers diamond mines. They took him in in South Africa as a house guest for a long, long time. And he wrote a book saying diamonds are essentially worthless because they have thousands of years of flawless diamonds already put away. Then he talked his way into the NBC newsroom and wrote this magnificent investigative study called News from Nowhere 
about how news actually is selected for transmission. In other words, everything he touched was, this is a flunk out from college. So all of these anomalies from the Harlem kids, the Spanish Harlem kids from my flunk out Cornell friend, finally shook my belief in what I had been taught, that it's an orderly universe, merit determines, and I could begin to see around me all the narratives that were disconnected from reality. They hardly were hidden at all. You know, they were all weapons of mass destruction narratives. And they occurred over and over and over again in every aspect, including in the world of medicine and nutrition. You know, there seemed to be no ethical or moral uh, break on what insiders were able to say and all the other insiders would agree with. So that when I turned to what obviously was wrong with school was that we were creating, I as a school teacher, was creating the hideous discipline problems that we then said we must have money to relieve that it seemed like a closed universe in which one hand washed the other one, that all these horrible kids from horrible ghettos were perfectly able to rise into valuable contributors, and it wasn't a very long distance to go. For example, I remember one I uh, I started a school year with, they were trying to get rid of me as a teacher. They gave me the worst class uh, on the eighth grade. The kids were huge. They had no tradition of scholarship at all. But I determined to utterly ignore that and to say that we were going to start with Shakespeare's three most important plays, and if they could master the parts, that I was willing to cut them loose from school for months, and they could travel around elementary schools, put these plays on, and then talk about the problems of staging them, of mastering the character, or something or other. And... I'd say 10 days went by. It was as if I was in a Harvard seminar, and all of a sudden, some kid burst out laughing in the middle of, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, thaw, resolve itself into a do. What are you laughing about? Don't you know? He said, we're the dumb class. You know, and from that point on, it was no longer easy because the other dumb kids had had the illusion, but it wasn't an illusion broken. But we still got some good work done. We invent the problems that we then have to solve. That's what I think all experts do. I don't think, including brain surgery, that there's anything the human skill is capable of that's very hard to learn. It takes some time. So you can benefit from prior experience, but it doesn't take anywhere near the time expense. So the point is that individuals have an innate, infinite potential, and that we're not limited by genes or species or Even race. Even a lust or to. If people wish to learn, it used to be called emulation. You're around somebody who can do something well, of course you respect, I mean, you're watching how they do it. 
Yeah, you know, we talked earlier about the disadvantage adopted kids ha have. When you watch your mother and father and you're 14 months old and have no language, you're still seeing how they deal with frustration, how they merge with one another or not contend with one another. You're seeing so many hundreds of skills that in fact you're biologically programmed to, to imitate. Later when the mind kicks in, you have some selection, which ones to, and which ones to, but uh, we don't allow that to happen because the very first thing schools do is strip the experience base away. I mean, the easiest way to turn your kids into geniuses, I mean, by the time they're seven, is just to front load huge amounts of experience, including dangerous experience. And my favorite story is Richard Branson tells it in his autobiography. His mother, who was an airline stewardess in 1946 flying the Atlantic, so not exactly, you know, the safest thing to do, she was desperate that he wouldn't become a dependent. And so when he was four years old, picture 48 months, he, she drove him miles from their London home in Shamley Green and asked him if he thought he could find his way home from there. And he said he thought he could get out and do so. Then she said, and now he said, <laughs> where is he? He doesn't even have many words, you know. So eight or nine hours later, when he finds his way home, he said nothing in his life ever seemed hard for him to do again. He drops out of high school, never goes to college, has his first million bucks by the time he's 19 by figuring out what people need and want and giving it to them cheaper or better or bringing anyone to offer it. What would the, our society be if we put millions of people through the same experience. I think it would be closer to what colonial America was than early federal America, when nobody wanted to work for somebody else. They wanted an independent livelihood. It would be closer to that than the corporate hell that we have now, with the corporations following perfectly rational logic have begun to need less and less people, but they have such political control over the legislatures and the federal government that there's no way to arrest this progress. Furthermore, as I spoke at General Motors about 10 years ago, a mid-level executive told me when I asked him, you know, you guys had the world. There wasn't any competition. What happened? You know, I remember when Jap cars came in, they had names like the Bluebird and the Fair Lady. I mean, it was a joke. What happened? And he said, what happened was this. That engineering, which used to be the fast track to the executive suite and profit sharing and all the rest of that good stuff, stopped being the fast track. Finance became the fast track, taking these huge profits, speculating in variable rate mortgages, in, in foreign currencies. That became the road. The same thing that happened to the steel industry in Pittsburgh. Wasn't moved out of Pittsburgh because any of them were losing a penny. They were making great profit. It's that the Harvard B School boys said, look, you can take this money, make a lot more, and not work. Of course, that 
would get rid of 100,000 steel workers and truck drivers, but who the hell cares about them? Didn't Darwin say they're not evolving, they're all Irish anyway? Well, this is, this is the juxtaposition between eugenics and that type of mentality where people are under control and someone like Branson who gets to go on walkabout, which yeah. is a rite of passage, yeah. which was around in the yeah. founding of this country with high uh, literacy rates. And so when we had a high entrepreneurship, self-reliance, literacy rates, people who had critical thinking and knew how to deal with problems on their own, because if not, you might die. Or other people think badly of if you say, I want a job for, you know, what do you want to do? Right, right. Uh, but, but these different uh, compartments are intimately interlocked. So by studying one and the other as if you're going to pass a short answer test, you're disabling your... This, Fragmenting. Yeah, yeah. The uh, s synthesizing power of your mind, which is what enables you to strike out so that history doesn't infinitely repeat itself. But now that's been restricted to such a small fragment of the population that we're in desperate trouble internationally because the Chinese, the Japs, the Malaysian can do this brain paralysis much better than we can because they have traditions that allow that and we still turn out on the 4th of July and say home of the free, land of the brave, whatever. Uh, so if someone were to walk away from this segment saying what did he say? It's that the bad things done in school have been intellectually justified. And you're not going to change that set of mind. So all the effort you make to systematically change schooling is a huge waste of time, energy, and resources. Because now the majority of the important people in the country make their living either directly from that or indirectly because you no longer have uh, a critical mind. And what is the definition of marketing? That when I took marketing at Columbia, they taught me it's overcoming sales resistance. Well, if there is no sales resistance, you know, you do that by juggling balls and dancing. Here's a pretty girl, buy the product. You can have her. You know, it's quite a pickle that we're in. Not Our managers don't think they're in a pickle, but they are too. Because the Chinese, for example, are so much more well-versed you know, in screwing rival power, <laughs> we've only been around a few hundred years. Yeah, they're reeling us in very nicely, thank you. If they cashed in the bonds they hold right now, for just forget, the dollar is paper. Give us our money back. <laughs> How are populations kind of prepared and indoctrinated and conditioned into receiving, you know, such, such uh, low, there's, they, they provide such low resistance to the Ponzi scheme mentality yeah, of yeah, the predators. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, the interesting thing about leverage, and it has been studied since ancient Rome, is you don't have to do everybody. You just have to do a few opinion makers. They do the rest. Here's how Andrew Carnegie did it with the Protestant churches of the United States. He simply, in one fell swoop, donated a brand new organ to every church in the United States. This died in the wool atheist, opened his purse, everybody got a new organ. Do you suppose there was much, anyone turned the organ down, or there was much resistance? Now, you accept the organ, but 
you know, you grew up in a Christian tradition. You don't you thank Mr. Carnegie for his organ? Don't you being human hope that something else will follow that organ? And you bet you do. How did Carnegie and Rockford get a hold of the schools? There were no pensions for teachers. The government didn't set up the pension system. Rockefeller and Carnegie set up the pension system out of their own pockets. And of course, they didn't give it to everybody. Your school had to conform with what they said was a balanced educational diet. Four credits of whatever they were, two credits of math, whatever they were, you could compete for the pensions if you followed the Carnegie credit system. Is there any school in the country who didn't? I never heard of one. How could you? Because the local parents would say, what are you nuts? You're not taking this free money? I mean, what you're doing isn't so great anyway. Why don't you do it his way? So this whole uh, religion of leverage which has just accumulated over more than 2,000 years, is utterly unknown except to seminar courses at the most elite colleges. You know, you may have a rough idea what leverage means from a physics course and see how, you know, connections, but you don't have any idea how you can plan the future for an entire region or a nation or a city by using leverage. The Chautauquas used the leverage. The best leverage available wasn't the newspapers, although it was good, it was the pulpits. And so mixed in with the real things the Chautauqua wanted to teach, were traveling Christian ministers. The whole Harper's publishing empire is, I think it's Methodist, but don't hold me to that, maybe it's Baptist. I think, and I think the Rockefellers are Baptist. Baptist. Yeah. But they're not Baptists like other, you know, there's about 40 kinds of Baptists. There's one small fragment of Baptists who are like Episcopalians. I forget the name of it. I was, when I was studying the Quaker transformation from pious, humble people to among the most powerful, certainly the most powerful small sect in the country, there are only 100,000 Quakers, they've had two American presidencies out of 40. So that's 5% and they're, you know, this. Being the most recent, right? Huh? Nixon being the most recent. Nixon and Hoover. So, uh, you can't think clearly, and all you computer folk know that unless the data is available, you can't think clearly. Well, someone knew that thousands of years ago. What data to remove? How to spin a local authority into your scheme. Let him do the work. School teachers, I was about to say by and large are innocent. They're all innocent because if they're not innocent, they're gotten rid of. They're drawn out of a pool of college graduates. The New York Times says are the lowest single scoring graduates on standardized exams except for school administrators who of all the uh, coherent occupational groups in the country, they're 50 points below the teacher group. So the managers, so-called, are the dumbest people of all. They know that their paycheck depends on because there's 20 people to take their job. They don't want, they may sit in a parents' meeting and say, we've got to do 
something different, but they're listening to the Tom Toms telling them what to do different. And of course, what to do different always says, identify the most influential parents. They're not always the richest. Do something different for those people. They'll be gone in three or four years. Then go back and do what you always did. So that's if if you looked at schools in 1905 and schools today, the correspondences are overwhelmingly similar. You would not say, "Wow." You would say, "Hey, history hasn't moved." Frederick Gates helped out Rockefeller at a time when the family was getting a bad reputation and like Carnegie they were having a lot of labor disputes. Uh, how does the idea of philanthropy and altruism affect American education? Philanthropy and altruism as it occurs through the institution of the private corporate foundation is the explanation for what's called American education, let's us call it American schooling. That's a pretty comprehensive condemnation. Do I have any evidence for that? Yes, I do. The two congressional investigations of where schools came from, one in 1915 by a guy named Walsh, one in 19. 59 by a guy named Carol Reese, both came to the identical conclusion that all the mysteries vanish, at least source mysteries, when you see how the foundations, which don't spend very much money, use leverage to control the curriculum, the testing system, the public uh, uh, perception of what's going on and of those foundations until very recently Rockefeller, Carnegie and Ford were the ringleaders. They had divided uh, responsibility. Uh, Ford took uh, Let me not misstep here. Rowan Gaither was in charge of Ford at the time, and he had met with Norman Dodd. And, and Gaither says, well, Mr. Dodd, you know, we, we have direct uh, directives from the White House, and we're, we're at, we at the Ford Foundation are ex-CIA or OSS. The White House, back in the uh, 20s and 30s, set up conferences of experts in order to homogenize expert opinion because inside the expert body there were colossal names and if they spoke all the other cords fell into line. I think Ford took over the psychological uh, output of schooling. Uh, Rockefeller and Carnegie in different ways were attempting to globalize this thing, the Carnegie Foundation, still today, if you go up to their library, I think it's in Austining or around there, and just read their annual report for the Carnegie Corporation, everything you ever saw on the front page of the New York Times in relation to schooling was cooked up in the project offices and then it's dumped on the world through the control of the media. How's the media control? Well, it's controlled through advertising. That's all. You can use your friends to buy more or buy less. When they come and say, why aren't you advertising? When you say, well, your point of view is so radical. Advertising? It's done. All right, cool. All right, so... Let's take at least a 15-minute break, cool this room off. I think the mechanics of how it's done is the most useful thing to someone just new to this. Yeah. 
as they say, well, it seems like everyone will have to be in on this, no? Only a few. Right, right, absolutely. So, right. yeah, we can we yeah. can cover that. We'll cool the room off. Let's get the lights off. Sound? Yep. All right. I'm going to slate. It's the day with John Taylor Gatto, roll three. Start with dropping my handkerchief. <clears throat> when we left off, we were talking about how the committees uh, were investigating the foundations. So there was a Cox committee, there was a Reese committee, they were looking into the origins of the education system and what, you know, and what is it really doing versus what do people need to survive and thrive in this world? And uh, they discovered there was a, a, a more than a crevasse, more than a, a Grand Canyon. There was a gap between what we need to survive and thrive and be successful entrepreneurs pursuing the American dream with a real hope of attaining it versus being a, a servile class. And these committees kind of snapshotted and said that there's some foundations and there's some things in action and they're trying to evoke real change and they're going after our children. They, they were puzzled because they detected an agenda, but they couldn't figure the agenda out. And with the second commission, the Reese, uh, a firestorm broke loose. In fact, Reese was never able to finish, thanks to the chief counsel. Was that Cox? The chief counsel, well, I know there was a lawyer involved with the Reese Committee, Catherine Casey, who was the lawyer sent by Norman Dodd to go into the archives of the Carnegie Foundation. Yeah. And after, after being brought up in a traditional you know, status quo education, she went there and saw the actual minutes and the words of these men in these meetings planning on how to take over this country and to take over the diplomacy and power of war. Yes, they yes. Would subvert was Dodd the chief counsel for Reese? Dodd was the chief researcher, and he was out of J.P. Morgan uh, earlier, and he had said, you guys need to return to sound ba banking, and they said, Norm, we're going to let you go. And then Carol Reese had called him up and said, Norm, we want you to head up research because we think... What they were describing as communist activity, from my research, like in the comprehensive Well, they sense, didn't see clear... That was the Bettenwall of the moment, and so th that was the easiest way to organize, but it was something far, far more profound than communism. Right. Yes. Right. So that gets back into Pestalozzi, Pestalozzi uh, Lavater, other people who were intellectual elites who joined clubs. It's like the Bavarian Illuminati was one such club that has a, lo a lot of the intellectual elite of the area getting together and in their drawing rooms they're drawing out the plans for other people's lives and they and they basically when you look at the origins of our education system in America it goes directly back to Adam Weishaupt's plans which you know are, are planned on earlier plans but still there is an That's organized right. effort to go after our education system well there's one more recent than that there was the metaphysical club at Harvard right around the turn of the 20th century and it contained such muscular figures as William James who is the reason we have a course in colleges academic psychology that's James Prestige brought that in and James was a kind of he was a, he had a ligature to Wundt, although Wundt intimidated James a bit because he wrote so much and so copiously about everything. But in the metaphysical club, besides William James, was John Dewey, Oliver Wendell Holmes, and a number of other of the shapers of 20th century American institutions. The most important figure, though, is not known to many people. He's perhaps 
the last major philosopher human history has produced, he was, it's pronounced Piers, but it's spelled as if it were Pierce. Charles S. Pierce, a strange figure, a part-time lecturer at Harvard, created the pragmatic philosophy that William James was probably the chief distributor of. But your key man's Pierce because he's much less, how would I put it? He's much more direct than James. James comes from a long intellectual tradition, a genteel tradition, and in a sense, James knows just what to say in every situation. Pierce is very nakedly describing that pragmatism, he doesn't make this connection, but I have, it's very similar to the old Norse religion that said, praise ice when crossed, a woman on her deathbed. In other words, no pre determinations until you see performance. Pierce said the truth and justice flatly do not exist. This was picked up, by the way, by Oliver Wendell Holmes, who then said truth and justice are what the strongest members of society say they are, and any sane judge decides a case before he hears the arguments because you don't want to rattle the framework of society. I mean, this is big time <laughs> radicalism. Of course, they didn't see it that way at all. They saw it as nitty gritty truth and all these superstitious, sentimental additions had occluded the fact Justice is what strong people say it is. Truth is same thing. So that's an evolution of, of Kantian philosophy where they remove cause and effect and then they, their irrationality can be rationalized. Yes, of course, they, le they left out Kant's, is it, uh, it's one of the three critiques. It, the, the, probably the best intellectual defense for the existence of God is from Kant. That, that was inconvenient for this group. But pragmatism, if you now connect pragmatism with the concept of justified sinning from Calvin, you have an absolute blank check in any situation to invent truth, invent justice, sacrifice biologically inconsequential people and invent any excuse for doing that you want. Seems to me that's been the driving force in, in, in American affairs for a long, long time there. But interestingly enough, it's been the driving force of an intellectual elite, I believe through history. It's just they didn't have the dominance that technology gave them. Well, Bertrand Russell has this quote. He's often misquoted, but when you actually read the book, the sentence starts with, uh, as, you know, I'll paraphrase, as, as Fichte would have wanted, the purpose of education is to remove individuality and, and, and self-reliance and all these other things. So the idea was that Bertrand Russell was noticing that what uh, with Fichte uh, in, the, in the 19th century was trying to do but didn't have the technology to do that they now in the Norbert Wiener, Bertrand Russell era, era of the 20s, the 20th century, now had the ability to you know, mass mind control billions of people at the same time. And it's all done on a basis of irrationality, a denial of cause and effect. But that goes back, you know, you can start looking at the, where the influence of utopia took place and took root in Francis Bacon with New Atlantis and how it goes up. And then, and then it's just formalized by some people using other jargon psychology in the 20th century into pragmatism. And it's all just a, a, 
they want to do what they want to do anyway, and they just keep using education to kind of, you know, say, well, this is a good reason why we're doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here we are then. Uh, what thoughts do you have about the amount of people in the origins of this country that were literate versus the amount of people that are literate today? Well, it's quite fascinating because the political census of Connecticut, I believe it was 1690, but don't hold me to that, very, very early on, showed a population that was for all practical purposes entirely literate. We also have the more than circumstantial evidence. If you simply look at the popular writing in early colonial times, it's taught in a seminar level in colleges today. And it's uh, as well known a novel uh, as uh, Fenimore Cooper's uh, Last of the Mohicans is in truth unreadable by college friends. Not because he's uh, uh, not a skillful writer, but the allusions to science and politics, history of all sorts, is so comprehensive and interwoven that the, the allusions himself defeat an ordinary reader, including an ordinary college reader. The uh, book I saw in your bathroom, Common Sense, sold 600,000, sold in a population of 3 million. You know, a country that was half serf, slave, and now you can find it on seminar level in Princeton and University of Chicago. Because so many people were literate at the origins of this country, they were able to publish these pamphlets. Yeah. And so when yeah. you'd have propaganda on behalf of uh, the elector of Hanover, better known as the King of England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you had these uh, retorts by, you know, Thomas Paine, who's not from America. He emigrated here. And he doesn't have a formal education, but, all, but somehow he figures out how to put things together for himself and speak in a way such that the common person can really get something from this. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's not so much that his aspect, you know, his propaganda. He's propagating an idea. But just describe the effect that, you know, just being able to have the printing press and somebody who could pick up these ideas without being through their formal schooling has the power to change and influence a country and, and inspire a revolution, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, yes. And in, in Payne's case, what he had mastered is even today what I tell kids is priceless to master. No complexity of ideas can't, in fact, with the pains on the part of the speaker, the writer, be reduced to plain talk and speech without, without harming the delicacy of the idea. And Paine really hit that on the button. He's quite a model in a sense. It's like if you want to write adventure stories, you want to read Edgar Rice Burroughs and the Tarzan books and the Mars books because you're just propelled from beginning to end on a somewhat more rarefied level, Dickens had that ability. Uh, and of course it could be distributed wholesale, but doing that would hand weapons to people you don't want to be able to be heard. You know, when you teach people to speak and think in academies, you've reduced their effectiveness to their associates there. So, yeah, no, we had some very productive uh, experiments in, in, in mass literacy, including a phrase, a label that's vanished from use. There was constant talk of something called the act of literacy. As long as you read well, you can develop uh, 
original thinking, but you can't communicate it. But to be able to master spoken speech, you can talk to anybody and they can actually understand what you're saying, or written speech, were known as the active literacies. The British government made those a crime, a prisonable offense to teach ordinary people the active literacies, not reading, because you want your flunkies to be able to read so they can follow your orders so you can go and play golf or go fishing. But to actually communicate dissident thinking and writing, you can reach way beyond uh, yourself. So the active literacies are, you find in the handful of elite private boarding schools, this tradition preserved. And in fact, in the academy tradition all over the world, there's a clear understanding that to be able to blink your eyes and knock off 300 words on anything at all, including a subject you know nothing about, is de rigueur. And so it is to be able to speak fluently, even on things you don't, where you can see, and I would love to know how it was done. The current president is masterful, not just good, He's masterful at the nuances of speech. That can only ha doesn't happen naturally there. Where on earth was that training? There are little figures he uses that have fancy Latin names to them sure. there. Uh, and of course, Bill Clinton was no slouch, but he comes out of a populist preacher tradition and, and, and is masterful with what he does, but the other is, is a formally trained science of speech. And I, I listen to the modulations and how he can shift from one idiom to another, and I said, somebody with this odd background, <laughs> you know, all over the world, who's my daddy, who's my mommy, you know, something intervened there. It's no accident, by the way, that Bill Clinton suddenly emerges from a state in which Rockefeller is the governor. <laughs> who, was, uh, who was Bill Clinton's mentor? Well, he has a variety of mentors. The very fact that he steered into Yale, which is, which is probably of the elite universities, the one that keeps the class tradition, the British class tradition, most actively alive. In fact, they all fled from Harvard when the Unitarians took over and are talking. Uh, you know, we're all in this together. So they bailed out of Harvard, headed west, dropped the biggest load, no pun intended, in, in New Haven, but continued on a line that you can trace all the way across to Seattle, leaving behind traces of this, this brilliant class-based thought. I once, years ago, and don't ask me to reclaim it now, but I once actually did trace the, the movement from the evacuation of Harvard in about 1805, 1810. What had happened was the Unitarians, who were one of the great heresies of, uh, of you know, the last 500 years, they worked out a way to initially convert to whatever religion had a church in the area. And then when they were the majority, they would vote the thing out of business, take the assets and reopen as a Unitarian parish. The, the entire Massachusetts school committee, no accident, every last member was a Unitarian, even though there were less than 1% of the Massachusetts population because they understood leverage. 
how, how you, the wolf, what is the uh, symbol of the Fabian socialists in Britain? It's the wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, they have a big laugh at how easy it is, you know, to fool. The funny thing is, is that Kitty Muggeridge, no, 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 no excuse me, the uh, Beatrice Webb, who, who is really Fabian socialism, when she carried her husband around, but Beatrice is the welfare state architect. She was the niece of Herbert Spencer, the most articulate, intellectual, racist in human history. Root hog or die, she sat with him on his deathbed for six weeks, and both of them agreed they were after the identical goals, but by different means. He said, exterminate the brutes, the famous line from Heart of Darkness, and she said, kill them with kindness. You know, I noticed you had Ayn Rand on your shelf. The idea of taking care of somebody else, apart from the innocent charitable thing, is that you ruin them by doing that. It doesn't take very long to ruin them. So, Beatrice Webb, the Fabian, and the great conservative Herbert Spencer, same bloodline, same goals, different methodology. Fabian Socialists also founded the London School of Economics, yes, among yes. many other things. Sidney and Beatrice Webb were working with Arthur Balfour and the Society for Psycho Psychical Research, I believe, and uh, the... Uh, one of the other characters that was spinning in that crowd was a guy named William T. Stead, who was uh, editor of the Review of the Reviews, died in the Titanic, and was the editor-in-chief over that last will and testament of Cecil Johnson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and of course, uh, and, and, and I have no idea how he pronounced his name, but I would call it Steed, it was the character in uh, The Lady with the Black Leather, what was... Um, oh, a sort of international spy series on television about 20 years ago. Diana Rigg what, what was the female lead. Yeah. And Steed was, was an inside joke. Kind of like the James Bond films are an inside joke to MI6 and Ian Fleming's yeah. whole career. And, yeah. and James Bond was an ornithologist, which is a bird watcher, which is what James Bond is. He's watching girls and playing this whole game yeah, for, the, yeah. for the De Beers cartel, which controls. And if you believe in justified sinning, that's what a license to kill is. It's for Her Majesty or whomever. <laughs> well, and Thomas Paine had some words to write about. Uh, you know, where monarchies draw their idealistic power and who created crowns and, and these sort of ideas where somebody is born into a situation where they're allowed to rule over other people and that's a collectivist man mentality where they expect you to sacrifice yourself to the state. So Prussian schooling is definitely created to uphold that status quo. What is the equal and opposite? How do people transition themselves and, and remain individual and grow and learn and, and do these things for themselves? Well, I think there are a variety of smaller inspirations uh, besides the fact that if you and I are correct, it's the natural instinct of people who sort of been made aware of the life and the arc of a life. But uh, oddly enough, the Congregationalists are very, very the little white spired beautiful churches that once I believe you couldn't vote in this state unless you were one. Uh, they taught that the Presbyterians, as Milton said, new presbyter is but old priest writ large because they met together once a year. And he said, that will ruin you, having this collective mentality. The congregation is sovereign in a real Congregationalist church. 
I don't know how they've mutated through history. And the minister is simply, you know, the, the official of the moment to organize the back and forth. But the minute the minister becomes cheeky or out of line, out he go, and usually if he asks for more money, because the minister is a functionary, the congregation gets the word directly from God. This is, of course, Martin Luther's enormous breakthrough, which he couldn't sustain, that uh, uh, what that's probably the great freeing line in human history, every man his own priest. No organization is necessary. The communication is direct. Congregationalists modified it and said there's some value in other people's opinion, but not too many other. The people who show up and donate to the church, yeah, we want to hear what they all have to say. But the minister, you know, so, well, so that was one source for a long time. These dissenting and independent religions that were unwelcome in Britain came here and there's so much space and it was so disorganized outside of cities. I mean, we had this infinite splintering. Uh, so that was, that was one sort. I think the scale of the country itself which couldn't be really monitored until very recently. Long ago, it occurred to me that when you, when you have to depend on, say, horses, no telephones, no iPads, when you get about 20 miles from the center, they don't know what you're doing. Once a year, blue moon, they send somebody out, and you say whatever the guy wants to hear. Back goes, it looks like everything's cool. That's how we had. There are no continuous governments in human history. None of them last very long, and I'm sure it's because this ferment on the fringe, which isn't very far away, eventually is fatal to the idea that you know, the hierarchy must be preserved. I think that's just a sign that there's so many people in this country. When things can get that obviously irrational, yeah. that there's just no intellectual self-defense, there's no one left to form, you know, a sentence, let alone a paragraph, let alone have the power to get it printed in front of millions of people anymore. And that's what I noticed. And no editor would dare print it anyway for fear the ads would dry up. Senator Oscar Calloway, in 1917, addressed the Congress, and he said that the J.P. Morgan interest, the shipbuilding powder interest, had all gotten together and bought the top, you know, they, it, they placed editors yeah. at the top 25 newspapers in order to control the content on political policy and military policy. So that was really the declaration, the first origins of the Council on Foreign Relations, which goal is to kind of control and, and mold the minds of the masses using official experts and historians. and So these other clues won't leak. Huh? How about Harry Truman's speech before the U.S. Senate in 1942 denouncing the Rockefeller interests as traitors because they were selling oil to both sides. What he didn't know was that the Krupp cannon makers were doing the same thing, making the German cannon, selling them to the French or anyone else who would buy them. Uh, they had already become a virtual global society. But uh, to Truman's denunciation of the Rockefellers on the floor of the Senate, you would think that would be just elementary sharing with generations of school kids. No, doesn't exist for all practical purposes, unless you're willing to sit in the, well, my generation, sit in the library stacks and go through. I did that in Columbia. I said, I'm going to find out Oh, now I'm going back to 1958. 
So I got a stack pass. I've never I've heard about stack pass. I'm down like in the sixth level. There's these huge stacks of popular magazines. That, you know, I'm interested to find out what the popular newspapers and magazines said about the Second World War before it started. For like the 90 days before it started, let me tell you two a publication. There not only was a certainty there was going to be war, but no worry at all. They all agreed that there was no ability on the part of any potential enemy to sustain a war, that all the gains would be right away, then they couldn't replace their losses. I noted that Quigley said not only did the British start the war with a larger air force than the Germans and more advanced technologically, but they could replace their losses and the Germans couldn't and the Japs couldn't at all. So they ended the war with the same plane they began the war with. Well, this was understood before we had a war. This is a good way to get out of the depression, good way to cow dissidents in the population always is to declare a national emergency. Then you have an excuse for foreclosing freedom of speech. What did Quigley do that was so unique or remarkable that no one else had done before? Well, what Carol Quigley, the head of the Foreign Service Department at Georgetown <laughs> University, no marginal school, what he did was use his invitation to be the only human being ever invited to view the files of the Council on Foreign Relations, and I believe its predecessor also. What he did was to actually write a major piece of nonfiction. It must be 1,300 words long, uh, pages long, fairly small print, and he made the fatal mistake of being a superb writer and thinker so that it's accessible to anyone who gets a hold of a copy of the book. That was quite impossible beginning six months after the book was published. And I can just see the manuscript must have been this big. So an editor uh, asked to vet the thing and make sure yeah, 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 and after all, Georgetown, this guy's safe. Out it goes. Macmillan publishes it, sells out instantly, instantly. And any conspiracy theory you've ever heard of is documented, only not as a conspiracy theory. It gives you the name, the date, the time, the actual letters. Oh, good God. Well, somebody got hung for that. Macmillan broke the plates, told Quigley there was no interest in the book at all, broke the plates so it couldn't be reprinted. Quigley's on a tape recording right at the end of his life that's stored down in Georgetown in the stack saying that they lied to him, that they had... Tons of who wouldn't want to read the book. I spent six months looking for a copy of the book and finally found one in, in the rare book room at New York University and had it stolen. And then a couple of months later, because I'd looked in so many cities, I got a call, mysterious call, from a fellow, I think he turned out to be a dentist, had a radio show. I know who he is. Okay. It's Stan Monteith. Yes, yeah, Stan Monteith. He said, I understand you're looking for, uh, well, I said, do you know where, yes, he said, I have some copies, of course, he had reprinted the copies. And after Monteith, over the next couple of years, several other people had taken the, uh, the, the, the Macmillan and reprinted it so much, in fact, 
that it became the basis for a growing number of aware people. They weren't sure what they were aware of other than that the story was not as delivered. Not, not in junior high and not at Harvard. It was a different story. It was a story that could accommodate two fraternity brothers at Yale running against one another for president. The big agenda. But, but Quigley's real gift to the rest of us is his absolute mastery of prose and his really interesting mind and his confession that he agreed with the pot. He simply, as a good Roman Catholic, didn't apply it with the secrecy. He said, I believe there's nothing anyone can do about this anyway. It was marvelous. I go back whenever I feel despair. And not an easy, I mean, it's an easy read because it's so well written, but it's a big chunk. He says, for example, that the only times liberty's ever appeared in human society is when the population is privately armed with deadly weapons. And to reach the acme of liberty, they have to have the same weapons available to them that the government has available to them. And yet we're not talking about some guy who rolls his car up. We're talking about this internationally famous scholar. So, Well, at the beginning, you know, the American Revolution, uh, the, the people who were fighting against the British government had equal arms. You know, they were landowners. They had, they had interest to fight over it. That stopped being equal in the 1930s with mechanized warfare and mass production because they've had Prussian education in place for 80 years and now everyone's an obedient worker and Amtsprache allows a lot of people to do things that they normally wouldn't do but now it's part of their job and now it's their responsibility and now it's their duty and all the things that Milgram drove home through his experiments look these people will kill other people if you put a white coat on yes yes well <laughs> It's quite exciting. I mean, it's, it's a hideous turn in human history, but it's quite exciting. The comprehensive surveillance mechanism prevents local groups from developing armament. These Arabs have done the only thing of which there isn't a successful defense, and that's to blow, just what the Japs did at the end of World War II, to blow themselves up, to blow babies up, to blow, not women very often, but still they're beginning to appear as human weapons. What you can do is suppress that activity, but you can't do it and say, we're, this is a free society and we're all in the game together. There are four copies, I think, of Tragedy and Hope around. Have you seen the, the first edition? I have, and I'm wondering when Macmillan has been forced to reprint it very recently, in the last year or two, and I'm wondering, you don't have to delete key sections, still be a big book, uh, to take the real sting out of it. I thought somebody with young eyes, a lot of stamina, ought to sit with the original edition and the reprint just to make sure. So what we're doing tomorrow afternoon. We have a first edition and we have several other reprints and we're gonna... Oh, do let me know. Because I have other people I'm trying to see the idea and I could say there's the project's underway and want you send them a little check and you know. yeah absolutely what do you think about Quigley's book Anglo-American Establishment you, you know I was again I was impressed by the thinking and the scholarship but I think the presentation puts it beyond the reach, not beyond the understanding, but beyond the reach of ordinary people without a coach. And 
I do think we have a pressing need to find, without diluting the complexity, to find the idiom. Uh, I, I think I said to Rich earlier, it, it drives me insane. There are things I've been rewriting for years because I'll, I'll try them out and I'll feel that an audience misses how that 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 plugs in. It's almost as if the audience needs a little bit of, you know, re-inspiring their curiosity, but then giving them a methodology by which they can start yeah. to reignite their learning. Very and then important. once they bring their attention and consciousness up a little bit, then they can receive some of these other messages. Yes. In the meantime, we can be coaches and, and help them kind of get that. The, uh, we mentioned this earlier, but the great favor Charles Darwin did for people like me is to indict the Irish as hopeless biology because my audiences are full Irish and I say don't trust an old broken down school teacher pick the book up and go to the Irish sections <laughs> because it's unmistakable his scorn and contempt to dismiss them as irredeemable. The Spanish is irredeemable. There's a quite a little catalog of people, not Swedish blondes, mind you. <laughs> no, but Dar Darwin does that because instead of observing how things actually work, they were trying to carry out an agenda. So he creates yeah. these ideas and he said, under these ideas, you people can do what you want and it's gonna make them hopeless. And if you think you're hopeless, then you're not really aspiring to climb up any ladder because there's no ladder because you've been told you're hopeless. Right. You and he lost. gets them to basically self amputate their curiosity and then they bring in compulsory schooling and that cauterizes the whole thing. And they're like, well, you won't be curious anymore asking questions. I think, I think Darwin himself had a lot of, and he's not innocent, but he had a lot of innocence in his character. Galton has none, none. Galton knows exactly where to drop these things to cause maximum damage and to institutionalize the anti-educational nature of school. Once it's institutionalized, nobody has to know what's going on. That's the way you make your living. And if you, if you were, for example, to extend the privileges of partial autonomy among school kids, you would shrink the establishment. And that is no way to retain power or income. If you were to find substitutions for the purchased supposed uh, improvements in curriculum. I mean, the truth is superb education doesn't cost a penny to deliver. If you understand what it is, what you're aiming for, and what you can use, it's a lot easier if you have, if you have money, but what money's usually used for is to purchase layer after layer of interventions, and those interventions prevent the educational result. Compare and contrast how Adam Smith felt about money and the earning of it to, to su sustain oneself versus today where it's just earned to buy more and compulsory you know, status, uh, what do you say, so status symbols? You know, conspicuous uh, consumption, these ideas. I must tell you, I, I used to be enough of a favorite at the Cato Institute that I was named the Secretary of Education in their shadow cabinet. That has to be, oh, that's when, did you know Marshall Fritz? No, I don't know Marshall Okay, he was a legendary uh, member. When I discovered what Adam Smith actually said, which I wouldn't deny that key people at Cato also know, I became very, very problematical because in the theory of moral sentiments, Smith, I'm gonna give a shorthand here. Smith says 
that to spend your time making money as a mark of insanity and what it will buy you is a bad life. But we should be grateful to the people who do that because they assemble capital, they pay the biggest price, and they create, uh, you know, improvements for everybody else. I don't think the religion of of libertarian capitalism wishes that complication to be well understood because there's no way to explain it away. He just as he's very clear that the peasants and the dukes son are the same people. He's very very clear. You got to be nuts to assemble capital. <laughs> What lessons can be learned from Ben Franklin? Yeah, Franklin's life is the best lesson. Franklin was such, I almost slipped into Pittsburgh Pitt profanity, is. but I won't. Uh, I mean, Franklin was not a morally nice human being in any way. In fact, his, his son broke off contact with him and never spoke to him again for the rest, for 40 years for the rest of their life. So Franklin was the ultimate pragmatist. He masqueraded as a Quaker, even though he had no ties whatsoever. The French who financed the revolution talked about this marvelous Quaker. I mean, he was like a national sensation over there. And he didn't disguise in his dress I mean, he camouflaged himself, sort of, he, he always walked a line where he could justify what he was doing. But his life is evidence from a huge, they're probably a lower middle class family, a candle maker. They always had food on the table, but his autobiography is worth its weight in gold many times. Because he explains how you can introduce the highest level curriculum imaginable to 10, 11 year old people. That his father, who had no touch with, you know, scholastic theory, would bring in every night a stranger from the street, set an extra place at table so that the you know, in-house uh, culture could be infused with fresh uh, input there. That he and his uh, friends decided that without mastering high-level written prose, their opportunity, I mean, he's 11 years old, and they say, how are we going to get a big-time literary style? when nobody, you know, they, they take the New Yorker magazine of the day, the Tatler and the Spectator, written, read by only the most hoity-toity, and they rewrote the articles in their own words and then would present the rewrite to strangers and say, pardon me, sir, could you tell me where this article might have come from, and when everyone said, oh, that's Tatler or Spectator, they knew they had mastered that. It, come on, they wouldn't do that at Harvard, Yale, and Princeton. These are 11, 12-year-old boys, and he's doing it while he's working a 60-hour week at labor. And he's putting capital aside for his own business by selling beer to the printers at their lunch hour. How does he get to do that? Goes to the owner of the print shop and he says, look, you're letting these guys go for lunch. Some of them are coming back woozy. Some of them are not coming back at all. Let me bring the buckets of beer in make a penny, and they'll be chained to the machine. That's Ben Franklin, mind you. So his accomplishments, 
I mean, he's the reason we have a post office. He's the reason there's a University of Pennsylvania. He's probably the reason the German isn't a co-evil uh, in Pennsylvania because all these little German potus groups were not speaking English any more than you know they could get by with and he found ways to put political pressure and penalties on them if they if their kids weren't surrendered to English training no he's a miraculous uh, example of what nobody can do if they know what to do and have some discipline mind you I, I would say nobody should not read Franklin's autobiography very, very slowly. Do not read it for the story, but for the details. And you have a formula that anybody could use. So there's for Ben Franklin. What could a student learn from the life experiences, young life experiences of Thomas Edison? Well... Mr. Edison, from New Jersey, begged his mother not to waste his time sending him to school. This before he was 12 years old, and to allow him to go west where, during the Civil War, where opportunity was burgeoning. And she let him do it a thousand miles from home. He became a train boy. That's the lowest job imaginable. You know, at, at whistle stops, you go out and buy sodas or coffee. You, you know, you're everybody's factotum. But he talked the train into letting him put a broken down printing press in the boxcar. And then during the Civil War, because he was able to connect things into new realities, he knew that the train stations got Civil War news at the same time the newspapers did. But the newspapers didn't come out to certain hours. He used his printing press to run current Civil War news instead of auctioning off children at the whistle stops he sold the grand trunk herald and because he wasn't the nicest guy in the world he varied the price from a nickel to a quarter depending on what the audience could pay he put together a substantial stake that founded his own plus he used the stake well, in the years he was doing this, to start three businesses, each one of which depended on the advantage he had by going up and down the, the Michigan uh, length there. Now, let me see. I'm years away from one of them. One of them was that he could distribute magazines and newspapers free. He'd just pick them up at some drop point, and he could put anyone out of business because he didn't really have to charge much to do that. There were a couple of other, I think one was a, a food business, so that when he ran out to get something for the passengers, he was the owner of the business. And there was a third one. Uh, he, of course, has 1,007 patents without a day in college. In fact, when he founded GE, it wasn't called GE, but that's what it became, he made the test for hiring executive staff so hard that he used to laugh and say, nobody with a college degree can pass this test. Now notice if all of this documented history was, and it's your birthright, if this were shared with you in third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade, notice that you would arrive at the age of 12 
with a whole different idea of what your prospects were rather than your hand shaking because you got a C on your report card and that probably would doom your, uh, your career. Uh, it, I mean, it's a colossal crime, and I'm speaking now as a detective story fan. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm staying away from the moral high ground here because it's so far beyond what we define as good and evil. And for the people who do this, it is good because as, uh, as Darwin's uh, Malthus, as Thomas Malthus says clearly in his essay, climbing the mountain the high ground, the moral mind. He says it's a kindness. These people are doomed to such miserable lives that to hasten their demise is a great kindness to them. You work them to death, you starve them. <laughs> You're doing God's work. He, of course, was a parson of the Church of England, which Charles was trained to be, but, but, you know, left in uh, Galton. We had people like Lippmann and Bernays who recognized that people were inherently irrational. And instead of trying to teach them critical thinking, they say, let's use fear and, and confusion to control them even, even That's more. That's Spinoza as the author right. uh, of that. Get a hold of, uh, they're around, a translation of Tractatus Religico-Politicus, published in 1690. And any outlook you have on Spinoza will change radically. You're in the hands of a man who could put Adolf Hitler and his high command in the shade. He had worked out all the ways. There weren't any escape loopholes. And he sold the plan to monarchs, you know, who had a long, hard slug to sell it to, uh, you, you know, the traditional upper classes who still had scraps of, 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 of morality, traditional morality. They still hadn't become justified sinners. Thomas Jefferson, in Notes on the State of Virginia, He's, he's trying to assemble, because Spinoza's ideas are already in America, so he's trying to assemble the possible good use that could come out of uh, an institution of schooling. That's why shallow uh, teacher college text said that Jefferson was one of the pioneers, but what Jefferson said was that unless five things are done, it will be a mere secular religion. And as soon as I saw it, that's Spinoza's direct positive program to get rid of emotional religion that's a wild card. Secular religion's okay, I and mean, that's what the Church of England is. Wasn't inspired. Men sat around in committees and figured out what God would want. We have one minute left oh. uh, on on this tape for today. Um, my question would be: in in the last minute, who was Niccolo Machiavelli, and why should every school child? Take a gander at what Nicola you've is. got to take a gander at Machiavelli. Machiavelli uh, was a Florentine at a time when Italy wasn't uh, a unified nation. It was a collection of powerful city states, or at least some were. And Florence was one of the most powerful, but it had important rivals. And Machiavelli, he was a, a middle-level politician, call him. And he was ambitious. So he wanted to, it was the famous uh, Borgia family. Cesare Borgia and Medici yeah, family. Yeah, yeah, he wanted to, he wanted to do what Henry Kissinger did. 
is to establish himself as a fountain of utility for the Borgias. And he really had an excellent mind. And it's hard to tell what his character was because he has other books that are rather morally grounded. But in, for the first time in history, the secrets that have been talked about in drawing rooms maybe leaked a little bit like Hobbes' Leviathan there. Suddenly it was an unbroken uh, presentation of how the prince should maintain and enlarge his power there. It electrified the planet. First of all, the people who already knew these things were ticked. And the people who suspected them were put in a moral quandary, a bind. Now it would be a deliberate choice. But for the great unwashed and for the uh, religious power that represented them, here was, and his name was, after all, Nick. Here was old Nick. <laughs> I said, here. Uh, you, you know, we could give us 10 years and no one could pass through school without being aware of these high or low points in the creation of their own society, then at least they would have choices. And I know some would choose to sell out, but others, because of that, uh, that romantic quality in the young, you know, that's why we send them over to get blown up, you know, would they do what they did in the 60s. There's a turning point in American history. After national policy... That's that David? Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to turn the lights off. You can continue talking. Yeah, I'll just mark where we, where we are. Oh, I know. Yeah, this probably ought to be on. But remind me tomorrow, we'll do this. After national policy was contradicted by the riffraff in colleges and high schools, Word went out that was never to happen again. A group called the Trilateral Commission published a book, they subsidized at NYU, it's worth picking up, it's called The Crisis of Democracy, 1975. And in shorthand, the crisis is, if the people take it seriously, We've got trouble on our hands. <laughs> so we've got to hide power in how decisions are made even more rigorously than we've done in the past. Just like Hobbes said, said power is never where it seems to be. Not most, it's never there. Those are always the, you know, the yeah. flat catch. If only Hobbes was writing for the average person, if only the person was literate, if only they had critical thinking so that when they were literate, so that their literacy didn't make them a slave. This yeah, or time. make them think of people like Hobbes. Oh, it's just another book. It's me. It's a book. Yeah. That's his opinion. Well, he was the advisor of the king, and the book stayed in print, you know, for 450 years. It's actually uh, in the great book set. It's, it's in with Machiavelli. Machiavelli and Hobbes in volume 23. Uh -oh, from that set over there. The Harvard Classic thing. It's the, uh, the great books of the Western world. Oh, yeah. Put together by Chicago. Chicago. Uh, I was accepted yeah. to the University of Chicago. I was a sophomore in high school. And my mother wouldn't let me to go. And my uncle graduated. It's all good for right now. Okay. Some won't be up there. I just wanted to make sure. That was loud and clear. All right. Uh, 
First, I would like to present you with a book. Not that you don't have enough books, but this particular book was written by a friend of Thomas Beckett, and he wrote it for Thomas Beckett. For Thomas Beckett, didn't have, in this author's opinion, enough intellectual self-defense to do what he was doing, and he was trying to help him out. And his name is John of Salisbury, and it was written in the 12th century. And I thought, if there was such a thing as reincarnation, this guy reminds me of you, and that you would greatly enjoy uh, this. 12th, I will read it with pleasure. Twelfth-century defense thank you, Rich. of logic and reason in a time of irrationality, and I took the liberty of uh, just in the prologue. I marked a couple pages there that has some. There's a couple quotes in there where he basically lays out why he's doing it. I thought, you know, I got a chuckle out of it, out of it and I thought you could always use a good laugh now and then. This will be. The very next thing I read. All right, now I have one last bit of housekeeping. Let me see. If you could read that to the camera while at the same time holding this mug, and it'll be the intro for the episode. Or you could change it however you like. Give, give me the high sign. Hi, I'm John Taylor Gatto, and this is What You've Been Missing. Awesome. Yesterday, the name of R. Gordon Lawson came up, and you raised your eyebrows. What does that name mean to you? Well, it means to me Soma, the magic mushroom, and that Lawson wasn't some fringe nut, but some Wall Street heavy hitter. So... I read it with great pleasure, not once, but t until it fell apart. Before you leave today, I have a DVD for you. I just have to burn it. I have the folder made and everything. And in there, I put Wasson's uh, Russia, Mushrooms, and History book, which is very hard to find on PDF. So I just thought you'd get a kick out of I it. I will get a big kick out of it. What does the name Anthony Sutton mean to you? I actually, I corresponded briefly with, with Sutton. He, he made the contact after he read Underground History. Uh, and his books about the rise of uh, Wall Street and the rise of the Soviet Union and Wall Street and the rise of Nazism were important parts in, uh, in a slow process of overcoming my own skepticism. I mean, I had all the pieces. I had many of the pieces, rather, but they seemed to add up to a reality that I could find no hint of recognition of. And in the copious reading I had done and and kept current, why weren't there any references to this at all? Or occasionally when someone like uh, Ramsey Clark would seem to breach the wall of security. Ramsey was toast. He was marginalized. No one ever mentioned Ramsey again. He wasn't a guest on any show. Well, the same thing happened as to Sutton because he worked for the, the Hoover Institute at Stanford University, which is very prestigious. And then once they started reading his work, they're like, you, you can't write this. And, and he said, that's the ticket out of here. I must go find out what's going on. And I think he wrote like nine, nine or more books on these various so subjects. And when you see how Wall Street funded the Bolsheviks and Wall Street was funding the Nazis and the Bushes and the Harrimans and all those families that were also eugenicists and the, the ones that want to do compulsory schooling and tell you what to do with your kids and all these other things. Like there's a very small knit group. And once you try to understand the philosophy of what makes them the utopian that are trying to shape everyone else's lives and, and violate their volition. I thought it was like that's it's overwhelming to discover that, but then you discover someone like Lysander Spooner or Bastiat, Frederick Bastiat, and read the book The Law, and it's so simple, and yet if you don't understand the simplicity, it's easy for these other groups to take it away from us. Yes. V very easy to marginalize as uh, who has time for this nonsense. I, I mentioned in our session yesterday that as I was poking around in for other reasons in the history of American adoption 
I kept running into the people who were the architects of American schooling. And I said, what possible correspondence? The chapter in underground history, Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede, is actually a kind of lens into my brain trying to prove to myself there was some sense in following this road. If, if the heirs of the people who fought at Runnymede had maintained an 850-year continuity, and then I found other organizations that had. I said, it's possible that someone with an agenda other than this. So, who was Ignatius Loyola? Well, Loyola was the founder of the army of Jesus, the Jesuits who penetrated the Reformation and eventually produced the phenomenon in history records as the counter Reformation. They slowed the momentum down because the Reformation really is founded, although Calvin is the eminence grease, Luther's every man his own priest is this wild declaration of radicalism to get rid of the religious the priesthood is to get rid of all middlemen, yes. There were many countries that outlawed the Jesuits in, this, in the late 1700s, and one of those was the, the province or electorate of Bavaria. And then there was a, a Jesuit professor of canon law named Adam Weishaupt who created a group. And, and what, what influence specifically has that group had on the education system? Well, it, to pursue that line would require so many illusions. Uh, I, I, prefer not to, to enter an area where I can't field the hardest questions with substantive facts, but certainly the sense of powers behind the scenes, very, very strong. Let me give you a, a few specifics. It's been clear since the beginning of standardized testing, that the tests do not predict. And the best American, the most prestigious American universities have either dismissed it or kept it in pro forma place. But actually, as Harvard and uh, Princeton told me, it's not a significant determinant. They just don't want to rock the boat that hold, the glue that holds this pyramid together, they don't predict then why is 10% of the school year and school budget devoted to exerting stress on so many millions of people and through the children, their families, and why do so many innocently ignorant school teachers say this will determine your future when it only does if you convince yourself that it determines your future. It has no predictive power at all other than to signal this is someone who will memorize whatever you ask him to memorize. This is a useful skill, an anti-skill. In the book, The uh, Leipzig Connection, Basics in Education, toward the end of the book, after talking about Pestalozzi, it talks about Pestalozzi's mentor, who was Johann Caspar Lavater, who was uh, working and experimenting on Swiss lower privileged children in a universal schooling system. He was also a grand master of the Illuminati. So since Pestalozzi and Lavater and all these other key figures that were in the Prussian education system yeah. were also members of the Prussian Illuminati, it just seemed natural to see the the takeover and undermining of, of nationhood of our society, the taking away of our identity through the school system is also making we as a nation incoherent. And it just seems like there is a very militaristic strategy that's been in place a long time. And notice what the specific 
mechanism is. It's an artificial extension of childhood, theoretically to the grave, but, but certainly beyond the point where learning anything is easy. As long as you indulge childish fears and childish appetites long enough, you've effectively rendered somebody harmless. Uh, you know, you can see it in its crudest form in the military, in the training of recruits, or in fraternities in the hazing of freshmen. But actually, yesterday we, I hope we talked about uh, uh, Richard Branson and the turning point of his life at age four when his mother drops him miles from home. Throughout most of human history, anywhere on the planet, childhood is over by the age of seven. And even in the, the most permissive cultures, it's over by the age of 11 or 12. People are, even in our own country, at the beginning of the 20th century, a substantial number of young women at the age of 13 were married or becoming married. I'm thinking in particular of, uh, uh, I'm thinking of a 18 volume history of the world that used to be for 20 years, the premium of book of the month club, uh, written by a husband and wife team. And still, a rather respectable history in and inside historians say it's not bad history. It's very, very... Did they also do a, a history philosophy set? Yes. Uh, I have it. Gino Denning just sent it to me last week. I just scanned yes. it in. Uh, it's on my desk if you want to go get it. There's, it was like a... All we need is, is the last name, and, I'll, and it'll trigger... And in, in any case, the fellow who had been trained, I think, at U Chicago as a historian, marries his wife, who becomes his co-writer and... Durant, Will Durant. Will Durant and Ariel. Ariel was either 13 or 15. There's a, a dispute on the internet about how she wasn't older than 15, and I suspect she was 13 when they married. Was Will some form of sexual oppressor? No. Instead of going to junior high school, Ariel studied professional historiography and its protocols. And she was a full partner in the writing, and Will died, predeceased her 10 years, and she continued to lecture, having begun her productive life when people began their productive lives. To extend this to the late teens or beyond the late teens is to fly in the face of, of the first admiral in... Uh, American history being in charge of a warship. Farragut. Farragut at the age of 12. Or, or uh, George Washington being the, the surveyor of Culpeper County, Virginia in his mid-teens. Very entrepreneurial attitudes. That or got. Jefferson running a plantation. His parents both dead. 250 employees. He's 12 or 13. But these Examples go on and on and on. Why have, why have we marginalized the young who whatever they lack in experience more than make up for in resilience, in acuity, they bring new eyes to old situations, which is the secret of scientific invention. So it's done because they're the most dangerous. They're the least overlaid with these conditioning uh, and and of course that must have been understood way way back in history alexander the great after all you're noticing you're observing that values have changed since the time of our founding fathers who were literate autonomous entrepreneurial they also grew hemp they knew the value of hemp. Oh my, george 
Robert, he did it for medicinal purposes, so I assume it wasn't. And Jefferson traveled the planet collecting different strains, and they had they had contests, and they had wrote letters about their, you know, hey, I've grown this strain, and it does, it does this, and they're, like, competing. And so the, the fact that you're not taught about this in school and the, the, the role that hemp played in making the sales and the, the clothing and everything was hemp-dependent. Oh, it's a miraculous fiber. There are some... Rather sober accounts of the lengths to which the Hearst family went because they were the largest forest owners in the country. They supplied the wood pulp for newspapers, but hemp newspapers are infinitely superior to wood pulp. So that they moved heaven and earth to create the narrative of reefer madness. <laughs> So if we're using wood pulp paper to make books these days, we're not only killing trees which eat CO2 and produce oxygen uh, yeah. to make paper towels and toilet paper and all these other things beyond books, but I noticed that a lot of the books that are printed recently, the pages are disintegrating. And when you get old books from the 1800s, 1700s yeah. that are printed on hemp paper, yeah. uh, they're still pretty you know, existent. We have a, a Johnson's Dictionary from 1848. And it's, it's not printed on the same wood pulp acid, you know, paper that we have today. So can you comment on, uh, they undermine education, but they're also undermining just our ability to get our hands on the books to educate ourselves, closing libraries and using types of paper that, you know, basically turn to, to dust. Oh, out. yes. And there's, uh, there's been, since I've been in college in the 50s, there's been a prevailing wise guy uh, ethic that you don't actually need to read these old books because there are plenty of abstracts, digests of these old books in existence, and that will give you the guts of the old book. Well, let's take Marcus Aurelius's meditations. What the digests don't give you is the wealthiest, most powerful man in the world. I mean, I don't know if that confluence has ever existed after Aurelius saying that nothing you can buy is worth having and nobody you can order around with your power is worth associating with. That's a rather acid. <laughs> so how old were you when you first met Marcus Aurelius? I was initially in translation in sixth grade in a coal mining town in western Pennsylvania where it was offered in translation and of course it's eminently readable and then in ninth grade there was an option of reading it in Latin or, or, or doing something else so my mother insisted that I read it, Julius Caesar in Latin, Gallius Dominus Suis and Partes Tres at 75, cor, Corum Unum in Colon Belgia. We had to memorize the early part of it. But Caesar's Gallic Wars isn't some, some old piece of fustian that, you know, if you're an elitist, you read to plug into the ancient world. It establishes the principle that a weaker force can whip a larger force by dividing. And being better prepared. Yeah. You can set the larger force against one another. And you see that in schooling, the ordinary classes are set against one another by constant, meaningless testing and small, inconsequential prizes being given to the people who test best and wiggle their hands in the air so that the ordinary classes are divided for a period of 12 years through meaningless competition. I noticed when I was in basic training in the Army and was told that I was going to learn in three hours how to take a rifle with 57 parts of blindfold and put it back together. I knew that I could not do that. I knew I could not do that. And yet, in a room with 500 other scared young people, we all did it. 
and, and, and they didn't say, and he finished first, you know, the important thing is, what do we learn that's enhanced by competition? I mean, what real do we learn? It gets in the way because now your rank becomes a factor rather than the quality of what you've, you've learned. I made these ideas clear to 13-year-olds at all times and found that after about 90 days, they became as addicted to ideas and the whys of things as I was. Whenever a new idea would emerge in the classroom, this is quite literally true, I would grab a piece of chalk and write it on the wall. I'd climb a ladder and write it on the ceiling. Inside of that first 90 days, there were hundreds of digests of ideas everywhere, on the floors when there was no room left. Front, back, sides of the room, I had world maps and national maps, and I could leap up and point to the origin of the idea as we know it, or simultaneously they came. As I say, it was roughly 90 days when classes that were considered the stupidest, people who'd never eaten off a tablecloth in their life, were actually, they were hot to talk about ideas. We couldn't have that. How could we maintain the social order and the economic order if we had people who became fully alive when they were young and could get up when they're knocked down? You know, I think a lot of the problem, it's very easy to assign this completely to sinister motives, and there are certainly sinister motives at work, but I think part of it is the problem of how we would manage a society that didn't require managing. And I don't think anyone's been able to solve that problem. The, the, the early America probably did it better than anyone we have easy access to. Because I think it's not about anarchy. Anarchy is just a void or a vacuum of government. It's about being autonomous. And if you take away the government, it doesn't automatically give people critical thinking or the self-reliance that, that they, they need and the compassionate communication that they need to work together with other people to achieve goals. So right. In your explanation of how you learned the most powerful lesson of doing the impossible, you knew you couldn't do that. And after an hour or so, you had just done something that you knew you couldn't do. I knew I couldn't that, do it. You took that experience and you taught younger people that they can do that because now they have more years. You had to be at least 18 to be in the Army. Now you're teaching 13-year-olds that the things that you know you can't do, you don't really know that. Right. And you need to get that up, up here first. Right. So the, the question that I would follow up with is, in your third interview on Gnostic Media with Jan Irvin, I... I heard you mention these words, trivium and quadrivium, and I, I thought it maybe is so, something that was off your radar, but you spoke eloquently about it. And so where do you have familiarity with the trivium and quadrivium, and what does it mean to you? I went to Jesuit boarding school in third grade. So I'm between the ages of seven and a half and eight and a half years old, and the curriculum reflecting back on it, which I first began to do 15, 20 years ago, the, the, the intellectual diet was not modified in any way for our tender years. And the devices of uh, discipline and motivation that would be used in an authoritarian world where they were not chary of using, but I do believe that their hearts were in the right place. I remember being humiliated. I told you privately about this yesterday, 
by a Jesuit brother from St. Vincent's College, which is across the street from Xavier Academy, where I went and was beaten on a daily basis by the Ursuline nuns, sometimes for mispronouncing French <laughs> there. But the brother was talking to us in the middle of the Second World War about the causes of the First World War, and he had written a list of causes on the board. I had a magnificent memory before drink intervened. And he said, could somebody face the back of the room now and tell us all the causes? And I, with my memory, I did, word for word. And he burst into a harsh kind of laughter, and he said, you fool, you believe me. He erased the board and said, these are the causes of the war. Now could you do it? And now chastened, I did, a lot less confidently. And this time, the room exploded with his scorn. He did it again. He erased the board. He said, you will never know the causes until you embed yourself into the primary documents and see how complicated a thing this is. That changed my life. I only wish I might have had a second year there, but... Before you can form your logical understanding, he said, you need to get in, in check with the, the knowledge, the actual grammar. What are the artifacts? Yeah, Where do these things the, documented? What's primary sources? And, and it probably has occurred to other groups, but, but the intellectual part of the universal Christian religion, the Catholic Church, had a a respect for scholarship and what what happens as you collect data is that it forms itself into patterns and if you record the patterns and test them to see that they hold true eventually that suggests behaviors uh, so that they they created a two formulae, a basic formula to, which Dorothy Sayers, and I'd urge all your, your listeners to read her essay, The Lost Tools of Learning. She's a marvelous detective story writer, and the detective stories really aren't genre stories. They're a, a comedy of manners about the British uh, upper classes, but the trivium was coming, becoming comfortable with a pattern of thinking in which you could dispel confusion. And then the quadrivium was pushing it farther into specialized areas. One of the huge mistakes that schooling makes, even homeschooling, is to organize is to organize the agenda and the goals in terms of subject learnings, English, math, social studies, science, because those categories, while better than chaos, are so crude, they tend to mask what you're actually after. Take the universal study of the English language. What you're after is a mastery of the written language, the spoken language, and your own writing. So you've got these three divisions, and now if you're after those things, your measurement's not through memory, it's through performance, which is so much more accurate. As we spoke about a little earlier in this session, the standardized tests aren't predictive, and every first-class university knows that. You don't select people because they scored here on the SATs or whatever other tests are administered because they end up disappointing you and you waste people who 
Uh, actually, so in real life, we don't use standardized tests to make decisions, whereas you actually do use the trivium to observe, to process that information, and to make informed decisions. Right. And, and while there are personal variants, so I think the fundamental thing is every philosopher in human history has said is know yourself. This is the fundament. Now you can take principles like trivium and quadrivium and you can do a personal adaptation of the, you know how they will work for you. But the course I actually followed at the beginning was to say, I know this is not good for the kids I've been hired to teach. And where will I find an unerring structure? I said, obviously it will be in the most expensive elite private boarding schools. So I made a 10-year study, although it paid off at the end of the first year, and I distilled the 12 secrets of the boarding school curriculum of power. Now I'm talking about not private schools versus public schools at all, because most private schools follow the template that public schools laid down. I'm talking about the inner circle 20 or so. Let me just name a few of them. I'm talking about Groton, where Franklin Delano Roosevelt emerged. I'm talking about St. Paul's, where the senator from Massachusetts who ran for president, the tall skinny guy, John Kerry, emerged. I'm talking about Andover, where the Bush family went. I'm talking about Choate, where John F. Kennedy emerged. I'm talking about one that not one person in 10,000 has ever heard of, Episcopal in Virginia, where John McCain, the populist, give me a break, emerged. I learned about Episcopal from the sports section of a newspaper. I'm looking for the next Pittsburgh Pirate defeat, and suddenly I see a tiny item that says at the homecoming football game for Episcopal Prep School in Virginia, 25,000 alumni showed up. I said, wait. It's got to be a misprint. I mean, I can understand a thousand, 25,000 people came from all over the world for a high school alumni game. So now I start to look and I discover that Episcopal, it's the naked revelation of the importance of religious tradition in uh, upscale education, over half of the elite boarding schools in the country and all of the inner circle ones are grounded on religion, almost all on the Anglican religion, which isn't faith-based. It was put together by committees arguing about what must have been in God's mind. <laughs> but but also there's a respectable number that are Quaker based. Now here we're talking about a tiny fraction of the population, no more than a hundred thousand people. It's produced in the twentieth century two presidents. How is that even possible? Statistically, what would a bookie say? The odds of this little splinter group who we all are taught are innocent and unworldly and pious. Well, so anyway, so I got the 12. So I'd like to, if possible, go through a few of these because I adapted them instantly to Harlem kids and almost immediately began to produce results. It was roughly 90 days because at first Harlem kids don't believe that anything useful to them is going to happen in a school. But after about 90 days, these kids start winning competitions with the inner circle kids of the Upper West Side of Manhattan, instead of being 
amazed and wondered about I'm called in and accused of child abuse. What on earth are these people doing? You must have written that for. I said, I will confess. I corrected the spelling and the punctuation. But that steel trap set of ideas proving the case is not mine. I'm not up to that standard there. So uh, I began to get hot water ever since. Let me share a few of these. We all are vaguely aware that literacy is at the heart of an intellectual inner life. But what we don't understand is that prior to the First World War, literacy commonly was divided into passive literacy, reading, and active literacy, speaking and writing. And none of us are aware that in colonial days to teach active literacy to ordinary people was a crime. Why? Because reading, you're locked in your own head and you still have the benefit of being able to read the boss's instructions about what to do. But if you can speak well, as our current president can, or write well, you can reach way beyond your own skull and recruit allies. That's a no-no for ordinary people. They're supposed to be so inarticulate, or their writing will look so funny with ink blots and things in it that no one treats them seriously. So strong competencies in the act of literacies are at the core of elite private boarding schools like Groton, St. Paul's, Choate, Lawrenceville, Gunnery, Hotchkiss, and each one of those schools, by the way, has some legendary tycoon as a patron, or sometimes more than one. Canton, Connecticut is J.P. Morgan's baby. So, and this is in no particular order. Insight into all institutional forms. You're supposed to know the logic, the steps that we arrived at a prison system or a library system or all the other, the military system, obviously. Uh, third, here's a secret. Some of your listeners, watchers, viewers will be school teachers. And if you teach history or literature, you will run into uh, you know, a great deal of difficulty moving kids. But if you approach those subjects and, and share this with the kids, that what we're after here is not a good story or memorizing details from Jane Austen for the test. We're after a theory of human nature. And anyone who's written a book that lasts more than uh, their own time has spent years closely observing people in interaction. And the trace left behind is an insight that you might spend a lifetime and never have. So that's what we're after, a theory of human nature drawn from history or philosophy or literature or law or the greatest trove that's unexamined is theology. I used to go to auctions and there'd be boxes of religious books, 50 cents or a dollar from, from a century ago, and I mean, nobody wanted them at auctions. And, but I bought them because they were cheap, and one day I have a barn in upstate New York. I picked one up idly, and I was in the hands of an intense thinker who was drawing on all history and philosophy to create an insight into human nature there. And I said, mm, interesting that theology is something that we don't, we don't regard at all if we're ordinary people. So a few other of the secrets of the boarding school curriculum of 
power, uh, mastery of the social forms. Let me, and I would say it didn't take more than two days to take kids who had never eaten off a tablecloth and get them to see that the signs they give off when there's a egg glass spilled on the shirt or when they walk down the street listening to the radio or when they're too aggressive in approaching somebody shuts off opportunity. They're like little badges that I don't want to speak to that person. And a lot of what we a lot of what we consider as racial or ethnic prejudice is simply that the disguise of these social forms is unknown to the person who then is discriminated against. And I said, don't believe me. I said, I'm going to instruct you in a superficial gloss of how to approach people. And then the intellectual excuse we'll use is I'm sending you out of school for days to gather data for statistical processing. We're going to test the local the local comparison with what the New York Times says the nation is thinking. And I'll teach you the elementary statistics in one class session that you need. And it's a legitimate project. But meanwhile, you don't want to approach somebody and have them jump back or say, if you don't get away from me, I'll call the police. And that's what you think will happen because of the overt racial prejudice on the liberal west side of Manhattan. But it won't happen, I guarantee. Nor did it. Nor did it. The transition, I, don't, I won't say it was 100%, but it surely was 80% simply from having a gloss on these social forms. And then this should, this should tickle people watching this segment. Then suddenly I saw that the rules of access to the great institutions of New York City by young people, which required, let's say, at the sub-treasury building where the gold is kept down in Wall Street, one teacher for every five students, well, a public school class of 30 students, you're not going to muster six teachers. But I said to the kids, how do they know you're not a teacher? Well, we're only 13. Nobody knows that. They know it because you're chewing gum with your mouth open. They know it because you're scratching your head. They know it because you slouch. They know it because you giggle. They know it because you carry a notebook that falls on the ground every few minutes and paper goes everywhere. Why don't we master what a college student who could be a student teacher, what signs they would give off. They'd carry a clipboard. They'd caulk it at an arrogant angle on their hip. They would be slightly nasty in taking attendance every few minutes or saying, when your mother hears about this, Jack, you know, I said, let's see if we can pick five people out of this class and penetrate security at the sub-treasury building, at the mayor's office, anywhere. We were never caught. Not once. Now, the Bronx Zoo says one for every 15 kids. But how are you going to even get two teachers to take kids to the Bronx Zoo? There. Well, it's easy if the kids can shift from being 13 to being arrogant college student teachers, never caught in eight years of doing this. Well, that's real self-esteem and gives them real confidence from experience. And to be able to go into Columbia, sit in the back of a class, and see what college is like before you have to go to college takes away a lot of anxiety. Now, I don't know why you said that, but uh, we... Oh, oh, okay. We, we were only uh, 20 blocks from Columbia, and I have a degree from Columbia, so I understood that the law school classes, there are 300 people in these 
banks of seats. And the only way, no one takes attendance there. Your, your grades on the tests are evidence of whether you've been attending or not. But if you sit there, slouch, and pulling gum out of your mouth, yeah, someone will say, who are you? Never caught once. So, so our age, this artificial extension of childhood that we talked about at the beginning of this, uh, this particular session is a secret of crowd control where people become their own prisoners by adopting the cultural signs that they're immature or they're not of our group and simply by seeing these things as languages. There isn't one English language. You know, there are 10 that are modified according to the, you know, and someone like Obama, how? I'm not sure. They understand this and they can shift effortlessly from one idiom to another. And I would say that to the kids. I would say, look, here's why you're reading English poetry. Now, there are a lot of reasons, but here's why we're doing it. You're going to find that the ordinary unit of meaning in the English language is three hard stresses long, or sometimes four, but often it's two, three, or four. But as you enter the realm of intellect and you have more to say or more nuances to say, you need larger units of meaning. Five, that's iambic pentameter. Even six, that's hexameters. There, the Greeks used seven septameters. And I want you to feel that, and you'll feel it by reading and memorizing some of this poetry. You'll have, you'll have the models built into your head to shift back and forth according to your audience there. Shakespeare, to the ignorant, writes iambic pentameter lines. And one of the reasons you don't want to even look at Shakespeare is all the lines seem to be pretty much the same length. But I'm going to teach you something that he knew four centuries ago. It looks like they're all the same length. But there's a breath pause in this speech after two heartbeats. The next breath pause is 12 before you've delivered your me. Three, four. There's this inner jazz at work underneath this regular pattern. You can learn to do that. Once someone exposes the secret to you, that's half the game. And the other half of the game is simply building the models into yourself so you don't have to think, hmm, now here. And yet we use an exercise that if I tell you immediately turned horribly dull writers into at least modestly interesting writers, and it's totally mathematical. I said, it'll take you a while to incorporate what I just said. So what I'm going to ask you to do is write 1 to 20 on 20 pieces of paper, put them in some sort of container, and draw them out at random, and then list what you've drawn out at random on a, and I said, now you're going home, not for homework, but to learn this massive skill, and you're going to write a paper on X subject, and if one is the first number that came out, the first sentence will be one word long, one beat long, and if the second one's 20, it'll be 20 long. Immediately, these hard, remember, I had to read 120 of these things at a time. And one of the reasons they were horrible is they were all, everyone had either a three or a four unit or a mixture. And there, now they had the kind of jazz 
that readers aren't completely conscious of, but they record as something interesting about, even when he's writing about a milk separator. And you as a filmmaker, remember Eisenstein's film of the peasants watching milk being separated on a Russian farm in the 1920s. Why is it so awfully interesting? Because he understood things that the eye is looking at the movement of light around the screen. It's looking at entrances and exits. 13-year-old kids from Harlem can master these secrets just as well as 25-year-old Harvard students can. And then they become preternaturally sophisticated. What on earth? How do you know these things? Because they're our birthright. We're biologically equipped to learn this way unless somebody sticks their oar in and intervenes and says, read Jack London and memorize. <laughs>
the Ed Koch, Dave Dinkins election of, let me say 1980, somewhere around there, that Dinkins was hopelessly behind by 17 points. And I had a black kid in the class come up and ask me why the city was so prejudiced. And I said, why do you say that? And he said, well, look at this. And I said, well, why do you believe that's true? Maybe that's to get you not to go and vote. I don't know, I said, but I do know that it says here in small print that they only interviewed 300 people. <laughs> There's 8 million of us. I said, there's 120 people in my five classes. If each one of you do 20 interviews, and we do it according to the, the way you get a random distribution, and that, that's easy enough to find out, well, we can have many times larger sample than, so that happened. We gathered the data, we processed it, and we discovered about a week after the time said he hopefully was behind that he actually was ahead by a fraction of one point. That's quite a skew. The election came. He won in the closest race in New York history. But notice that a random group of 120 13-year-olds had produced more accurate information. The math in the statistical processing is hardly daunting for a fifth grader. You know, so why aren't the 70 million captive school children involved in, if nothing else, data gathering? Since obviously it's a crucial part of uh, commerce. You know, opinion, well, there must be a reason they're not used that way, nor do they hear about statistical sampling until they're in college, for the most part. Huh? Why not? According to Alfred North Whitehead, one of the major mathematicians of the 20th century, other than addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, the only crucial piece of math for everyone to learn is statistical sampling predictions because the society, the economy is organized around those things. The politics is organized around those things. He said that in Aims of Education, which I think was published in the mid-1940s, well, you know, 60 years have gone by, and where, where is it? He's hardly a radical. Is it possible to train fleas before you break their will? Oh. And what can one learn from the gene sequencing hobbies of 11-year-olds? I got a foundation award at a fancy hotel in Washington, D.C., Oh, I guess about 15 years ago. It was all, certainly a, a while ago. And sitting next to me was an 11-year-old boy receiving the same award from the foundation. And, I, I mean, I was tickled. Here's this little skinny Chinese kid, and he has and made some scientific breakthroughs. So, you know, I'm patronizing him the way I've been trained to do. And I said, well, how did you learn to sequence genes, you know, instead of swimming? I'm a swimming champion. I remember he said that to me. I have a lot of metal. So he was a well-balanced 11-year-old kid. And, and these days I understand he's a uh, college professor in Seattle. But in any case, he said, my, my uncle or my grandfather explained to me 
that the way you train fleas, he hit a soft part in me because I used to go to Hubert's Flea Circus on 42nd Street and watch fleas draw Roman chariots and swing on trapezes. He said, you've got to break their spirits. If you put fleas in a container, they'll instantly leap off and head off in all directions because they have flea agendas, and even they don't haul off in the same direction. They have individual agendas. So he says, you gotta, you got to break that autonomy in the flea first. And the way you do that is you put them in a container, small, with a lid on, and the fleas keep attempting to follow their own agenda and they strike themselves over and over again. And if you come back in an hour or so, they're all huddled in a mass together. Now when you take the lid off, they don't even try to escape. Now, he said, you can impose your will on the flea. The minute the 11 year old kid said that to me, I knew that I had been hired as the lid on the container. Not that I hadn't sabotaged it somewhat, but nevertheless, that's what we all had been hired to do. And this principle was understood. Training fleas was a, a delight of emperors thousands of years ago. And whoever trained those fleas understood the principle and saw that it could be applied as it is in military training to human beings, as it is in much religious training. Not all, but much. So you've got a character like Vunt who believes that children have no soul, and he's designing an education system, and then you've got these Machiavellian techniques being layered in on top of it of how to break the will of animals, and it's being used to train our children. Yeah, what's surprising is that these insights and even these activities that don't depend on modern technology. I mean, these are understood a long time ago. And the only subject at the Roman Collegia in the fifth century was, I'll put an umbrella over it, crowd control. You know, how you divide to conquer what buttons on the human organ you press to produce certain sounds. I mean, that's 16 centuries ago. What has happened in the intervening 16 centuries? They forgot that, or was it added to? Has it become amazingly sophisticated? Less and less people necessary to produce more and more leverage. Is there a connection between the ideals of someone like Calvin and his uh, espousing a, a theocratic state and modern states like Israel, which are also built along the same theocratic terms? I think, uh, and I'm trying to be as fair as possible to the villains in this, I think there's some impulsion in everyone to have certainty that even as babies were aware of how many accidents, how much menace is out there, jeopardy, certainty. So to follow uh, a list of rules, algorithms, you know, is emotionally very satisfying, but it doesn't work if everyone's not doing it. You know, and the minute everyone's doing it, you don't have to do it. You now are handed freedom because the menace has been reduced of other people experimenting with humanity, enlarging its boundaries. Uh, and then economically, of course, your capital's at risk if that's the overproduction thing. I hope we talked about that yesterday because it finally was the tipping point in the late 19th century as corporations were enlarging and layering themselves. Men like Carnegie and Rockefeller and Astor, they were fully aware 
that human ingenuity was a tremendous risk to capital formation because to talk people out of their wealth on the grounds that you can multiply it doesn't work if too many people invent ways to do something better than your investment, you know, the capital's destroyed. So the easiest way to manage the future and the present, of course, they saw a series of financial crises all through history, but especially in the 19th century, where the boot of the master had been lifted off ordinary people, and they were recklessly inventive. I mean, America's producing more inventions than all the rest of the world put together. You can't have that, because on that new base, the next base is going to be frightening. So a term existed and exists, but it's been camouflaged in in the 21st century called overproduction. You have to use government to control overproduction, dumping too many goods or services on the market that it can't absorb. And the easiest way to do that, at first you try licensing, you know, and other kinds of government subsidy to favored groups. But ultimately, the killer app is to remove the ability to be inventive from the ordinary mass. These days it's called overcapacity because to penetrate what that means is much harder than to see instantly what overproduction means. Then a second a second uh, menace emerged in the late 19th century, but by 19, the late 1960s, it was clear it too would have to be controlled. That's called hyper-democracy. If too many people take democracy seriously and understand how to form alliances with one another, to, per, to confront power with power, then power becomes much less effective. So when the kids stopped the Vietnamese War, waves of them, I mean, this was so intolerable, the cost to privileged classes of this reign of money, the cost to the government of not being able to suppress dissent on the grounds that this is an emergency. This couldn't be allowed to happen again. The Trilateral Commission gave me the, uh, the break I needed to understand this more precisely. They underwrote the publication of a book called The Crisis of Democracy in 1975, published by New York University Press, in which now you have to have training in reading between the lines because the sophisticated power brokers aren't nakedly making these statements. But if you read Crisis of Democracy carefully, you will see that the crisis is too many people took it seriously and translated the principles into action and cost the industries and the hierarchy a war that, you know, now the next war would be harder to, to run, I mean, to get together. Uh, it, it would be more absurd. At least you could make a case in those jungles, but now you're going to have to make a case in the arid deserts of Iraq or in the mountains of Afghanistan why national security depends on uh, uh, on suppressing these barefoot people and people whose weapons are blowing up their feet in their underwear. Hey, they're, you know, they're going to take the bread out of your family's mouth. I, I, I remember the attempt 
in Nicaragua under the Sandinistas to communicate the idea that it was just a stone's throw from our southern border. And these people might pile into their 20 and 30 year old vehicles and that'd be this thousand mile drive north and an into Texas they'd come. Well, you know, we, we, our economy, of course, cannot function without warfare. So that when these things are over, count on the fact that if we have to attack the South Pole, the penguins will a clear and present danger. In uh, the, the Paris Peace Conference, 1919, pre-CFR formation, Colonel House and these characters are hanging out, and Ho Chi Minh comes in and says, we want to be free like America, we love democracy, we want to do this, and instead of helping them out, helping them be, to become free, they're like, well, we're going to have to take them out. That makes a good place to have We war. need enemies. We have to have enemies. The interesting thing about the book, The Crisis of Democracy, is that spreading out like ripples from a stone thrown in a pond, the popular magazines and press, Time Magazine did a cover story on too much democracy, question mark. Of course, they concluded, you bet, in a complicated, high-tech world, you can't allow non-experts to make decisions there. But it was everywhere. So the tom-toms, they're interconnected, and they beat simultaneously or nearly so. What's the role of curiosity? Well, is it not? Is it not the lever that produces invention? I mean, it forces you really in a fun way to think for yourself there. And then it turns out that the secrets of nature or of society aren't really very hard to penetrate as long as you remain curious. How do you destroy curiosity? Because we all say little babies are always curious. How do you destroy curiosity? Well, one good way is to sit people in chairs, tell them to speak when you're spoken to, threaten them with upcoming tests if they don't memorize usually erroneous material. It's fascinating. Show me a school book that deals with Admiral Perry's opening of Japan. And the school book, last one I looked, was nominally under the uh, aegis of the Librarian of Congress, so a major scholar. And it will say that, essentially it will say that we decided that Japan should be part of the modern world. It wasn't fair to leave them in medieval. And so Admiral Perry sailed over there and negotiated, and they said, okay, you can have uh, coaling bases, or we'll take care of sunken whaler crews. What no one says is that Perry had 11-inch naval rifles, the standard of the day. The Japanese had medieval cannon with a range of about 75 yards, and Perry's guns could reach 10 miles. And that Perry impo uh, emphasized the destructive impact of his force of three black gunboats. I mean, somebody had to actually paint the boats black by destroying some structures on the shore. Then they rode out fast enough and said, you know, please, Massa. <laughs> when did the American dream become one of lifelong servitude and debt and debt slavery? It's so fascinating that the American dream is enunciated in 1859 by Abraham Lincoln speaking to the Wisconsin Agricultural Associations, that's 152 years ago. And he says, the American dream is to write your own script, to have an independent livelihood. That's why we don't have giant corporations like Britain and Germany have. 
People only work for somebody else long enough to put a stake together and they figure out what people need and then they do. So the American dream was as elementary school books, it was liberty, freedom, personal sovereignty. And it was rather unique in the history of of political nations around the earth or even tribal bodies. And did it work? It almost immediately propelled us into a paramount position among the, just because there's a, I, I'm not hostile to, but I'm also a stranger to IT and and the high-tech world, but I do try to keep up with the theory of what's going on. And about three or four years ago, there was a wonderful analytical book called uh, The Cathedral and the Bazaar. Are you familiar with it? I don't remember it? who wrote it. At all. And I read it and I saw almost immediately what I thought nature was about, proving itself through IT. The author or authors maintain that the crowd collectively has more wisdom and insight collectively and gave some hair-raising examples. A huge gold ore body in Canada was discovered by the company putting its limited, it knew that there had to be an ore body there, but it also knew that if it used the, the normal procedures and, and the whole proved dry, excuse the mixed metaphor there, that they would be exhausted and they would have to sell what they knew. It's, it's a, a gold corp today, GG on the uh, exchange. So how did they discover the ore body? Instead of going to the recognized engineers and blowing all their water on one shot, on the internet they globally put out to anyone at all, from any background at all, they wanted a theory of how to find that ore body. And somebody who had nothing to do with mining, the, uh, pick up the book, because I'm losing the richness of the details. But it's the essence of how non-experts can make some of the biggest discoveries. Oh, oh, well, there is a book. I made a note to bring up here. There's a book that used to be required reading at MIT, and maybe still would be. It's by a, a middle-level uh, physicist named Robert Scott Root Bernstein. It's called Creativity. It's this thick, and the structure internally is so maddening. It's done in the form of a, a, a group discussion among different people, why he did that. But eventually I forced myself to read it, and what just comes pouring out of it is how actual life world changing discoveries are made. This is an MIT textbook. Apparently by adding funds and assistance to a project, you almost destroy your ability to make these breakthroughs. People who have to saw ice cube trays in half to make a piece of lab equipment, etc., etc., are the people who transcend the conventional. Now, that's often then taken over by a big project. One of the most recent dramatic examples, and I'm sure you can Google or whatever the search engine term is, there was a of two or three years ago in 60 Minutes, there was an account of a new way to treat cancerous tumors without, uh, with radiation without any 
side effects at all, and it had been discovered by a man in his garage who was, uh, had nothing to do with cancer research. John Kansius is who you're talking about, right? Who? John Kansius? Yes, Kansius. And he's, he worked in radio and television. And he, he was a kid. He was an enthusiast. And he knew that if you shot radio waves through, through metal, that it heated up. And he wondered if it would kill a tumor, but not leave the devastation that radiation does. And in fact, it did. Now... We don't have to take it on faith. The leading cancer researchers in the world said this is a whole new ball game, you know, and some key research hospitals and took the process over. And Kansas's motivation was he was in the terminal stages of cancer himself, and he knew that the established treatments wouldn't help him. And in fact, he was too far gone and he died. I think the thing is at U Pittsburgh now, but, but it's at, at some major universities. But I heard the reigning expert in the world say, this is, makes all the past, you know, irrelevant. But that's a commonality. I copied some notes out of uh, the Ruth Bernstein book. He said that intensive and narrow scientific training will guarantee that you never make a scientific breakthrough. You know, you can get the best Johns Hopkins, it doesn't matter. It's the narrowness of training. The people who make these breakthroughs have as wide a range of mental and physical tools as possible. They almost invariably play musical instruments, are good at languages, etc., etc. Most successful people in physics make it by going off by themselves and learning whatever they want to, not following the history of the physical sciences. What they learn from mentors is how to deal with ambiguity. But the established bodies of scientific knowledge get in the way of thinking afresh. You know, as soon as you hear these things, they're so commonsensical, you say, of course, why didn't I think of that? Uh, just a couple more here. Virtually every scientific pioneer Men like Edison, Franklin, Einstein, Planck, Maxwell, many others had early opportunities to do absolutely independent research. All of them were in their early 20s, which has given rise to an understanding in the higher levels of the sciences that if you haven't made a major breakthrough by your middle 20s, you're not going to. What you can do is head up a project and be a bureaucrat and take credit, as many college professors do, for the discoveries of your students, but you're not going to be worth, worth gambling on. It isn't the age in itself that limits insight. It's the imprint of rigid patterns of habits. Now, I happen to dig up a wonderful quote from William James Psychology, I think printed in 1890, and the book given credit for establishing psychology as an academic subject. And uh, uh, James was, of course, uh, uh, it's, uh, he had ambivalent feelings, but he certainly was a disciple of Wundt uh, there. Now, this is a direct quote from William James' Psychology 121 years ago. Habit is the enormous flywheel of society, its most precious agent. 
It alone saves the children of fortune from the envious uprisings of the poor. It alone prevents the most repulsive jobs from being deserted. It holds the miner in his darkness. It keeps different social strata from mixing. Well, I'll just, just complete. Um, one of the insights of discovering that really electrified me as I was reading it is how frequently the great discovery in the scientific arena is not made by the specialists in that area by somebody from another area completely divorced who transfers into chemistry or physics, has fresh eyes, cuts through the habits that lock the mind in place, and makes the discovery. It says freedom and flexibility is much more valuable than planning. Insight comes only by getting out of ruts and plugging into a variety of methods. So, th th these great truths, it isn't that we're discovering them now, we're taking them out of the burial places and saying, hey look, wake up! You know, the, the world is much bigger and much different then you believe it is because you've been conditioned to believe it's that way. I have something here. I have the six purposes of schooling as laid down in 1917 by the man who Harvard named their honor lecture in education for. So far from being a fringe individual, this guy is the reason the Harvard Honor Lecture in Education is named as it is. The Ingalls Lecture. Looks like Inglis, but it's pronounced Ingalls. And I would like to read you the six purposes of schooling. I moved heaven and earth, and it took years to find this book. Just like trying to find, in past years, a copy of Carol Quigley's Tragedy and, and Hope. I learned about Ingalls from the 20-year president of Harvard, uh, James Bryan Conant, who was a poison gas specialist in World War I was a very inner circle of the atomic bomb project, World War II, was the High Commissioner of Occupied Germany after the war. So he wrote, oh, there must be 20 books about the institution of schooling, of which he was completely uh, a proponent. And I forced, he's a very, very bad writer, I forced myself to read most of these books, and in one of them, he says that if you really want to know what school is about, you need to pick up the book that I'm referring to here, Principles of Secondary Education. Two years it took me to find a copy of the book, 750 pages, tiny print, and as dull as you, your imagination can conceive, and furthermore, it's not until you get to the very middle of the book, in an unlabeled section, that he spills the beans. Let me spill them for you. These are the six purposes, or functions, as he calls them. The first he calls the adjustive function. Schools are to establish fixed habits of reaction to authority. That's their main purpose, habits of reaction to authority. That's why school authorities don't tear their hair out when somebody exposes that uh, 
uh, that the atomic bomb wasn't dropped on Korea as a uh, history book in 1990s, printed by Scott Forsman, distributed, and why each of these books has hundreds of substantive errors. Learning isn't the reason the texts are distributed. So first is the adjustive function, fixed habits. Now, here comes the wonderful insight that being able to to analyze the detail will give you. How can you establish whether someone has successfully developed this automatic reaction? Because people have a proclivity when they're given sensible orders to follow it. That's not what they want to reach. The only way you can measure this is to give stupid orders and people automatically follow up. Now you've achieved function one. Have you ever wondered why some of the foolish things schools do are allowed to continue? Number two he calls, he calls it the integrating function, but it's easier to understand if you call it the conformity function. It's to make children as alike as possible the gifted children and the stupid as alike as possible because market research uses statistical sampling and it only works if people react generally the same way. The third function he calls the directive function. School is to diagnose your proper social role and then to log the evidence that here's where you are in the Great Pyramid so that future people won't allow you to escape that compartment. The fourth function is the differentiating function. Because once you've diagnosed kids in this layer, you do not want them to learn anything that the higher layers are learning, so you teach just as far as the requirements of that layer. Number five and six are the creepiest of all. Number five is the selective function. What that means is what Darwin meant by natural selection. You're assessing the breeding quality of each individual kid. You're doing it structurally because school teachers don't know this is happening. And you're trying to use ways to prevent the poorer stuff from breeding. And those ways are hanging labels, humiliating labels around their neck, encouraging the shallowness of thinking, you know. I often wondered, because I came from a very, very strict Scotch-Irish culture that never allowed you to leer at a girl. Well, when I got to New York City, the boys were pawing the girls openly, and there was really no redress for the girls at all, except not showing up in the classroom. You know, high absentee rates. Well, you're supposed to teach structurally that, th that sexual pleasure is what y you withdraw from a relationship and everything else is a waste of time and expensive. So the selective function is what Darwin meant by the favored races. The idea is to consciously improve the breeding stock. Schools are meant to tag the unfit with their inferiority by poor grades, remedial placement, humiliation, so that their peers will accept them as inferior. And the good breeding stock among the females will reject them as possible partners. And the sixth is the creepiest of all, and I think it's partly what Tragedy and Hope is about. It's a fancy Roman name. 
the propydeutic function, because as early as Roman big time thinkers, it was understood that to continue a social form required some people being trained that they were the custodians of this. So some small fraction of the kids are being ready to take over the project. That's the guy in the honor lecture, and it will not surprise you that his ancestors include the major general at the siege of Lucknow in India, famous for tying the mutineers on the muzzles of the cannons and blowing them apart, or somebody who had, was forced to flee New York City, a churchman because, at the beginning of the American Revolution, because he wrote a refutation of Thomas Paine's common sense. They were going to tar and feather him. He fled and was rewarded by the British by making him the Bishop of Nova Scotia. Those are Ingalls' ancestors. <laughs> so Al Ingalls is certainly, when I learned of this and wrote to Harvard asking for access to the Ingalls lecture, strike me dead, Lord, if I'm exaggerating at all, I was told, well, we have no, there is no Ingalls lecture hasn't been for years, and we have no records. It was the same thing that happened when I discovered that uh, Elwood P. Coverley, the most influential schoolman of the 20th century and the bionomics genius, had been the elementary school editor of Houghton Mifflin and I wrote out in Mifflin, if there are any records? And they said, we have no record of anyone named Elwood P. Coverley. Now Harvard's telling me there's no Ingalls lecture. A week passed, and I got a call from Harvard, from some obscure office at Harvard, saying, what, what is your interest in the Ingalls lecture? <laughs> I knew that I was on thin ice. And I said, well, uh, James Conant referred me in his books to the man the Ingalls Lecture is named after. And I was wondering if I could get some background on this fellow and a list of the lectures. And in due time, I got a list of the lectures and instructions how to access the texts, but not easily. You know, enough hoops that someone who has to mow the lawn and burp the baby, you know, wouldn't jump through those hoops. Uh, I was able to prove Harper's wouldn't publish when they did the cover essay I wrote, which Lou Latham named Against School, probably after Jeremiah's Against. But I had called uh, uh, the artificial extension of childhood because I think that's the key mechanism at, at, at work here. So. They wouldn't print the information about uh, uh, Coverley because how Mifflin denied it. It was only months afterward that I looked through my extensive library of incredibly dull books about schooling and opened in the facing page, said Elwood Coverley, editor-in-chief, elementary school, uh, publishing arm of, uh, of Howard Mifflin, by the way, the secondary editor-in-chief was Alexander Ingalls. So you see how, uh, how this cousinage, the incest, works. If Martin Luther's idea was to cut out the middleman and teachers 
read books? Why can't students just read books instead of going to the middleman for their information? Well, the, the more highly placed the schooling is, the more likely it is that they do do that. They go to primary documents. They understand how suspicious all secondary documents are. Not that they aren't useful, but they give the, the writer or the editorial staff the ability to shift the information. That's why in the reprints of Quigley's Tragedy and Hope, we really need some of you out there to sit with the original and sit with the reprint and make sure the key things aren't elated on perfectly reasonable grounds that, you know, we want to shrink this down from 1,300 pages to 1,000 or, or whatever. Oh, it was an oversight. We have uh, eight minutes, eight, eight, nine minutes left. I have two questions, and then we can uh, do an informal book signing and get you out of here. What time? Yeah, well, you should want to know what happens to an ordinary class of 13-year-olds when they get a smattering of that. I mean, as much as they can absorb in a short time. Well, many of you will have seen Strawberry Fields, the monument to the Beatles in Central Park. I don't want to pat myself on the back because I didn't much care for the Beatles and I hate using Parkland for it. But I was approached by three girls, two of them here, bitterly complaining that the Community Planning Board had denied Yoko Ono's petition to build strawberry fields. And they were furious that this had been done. And I said, well, you don't have to accept their decision. They're the lowest part of the pecking order. First, according to protocol, you have to take your case to them. So we'll book you an appointment, and you lay down the reasons you want to take three acres of Central Park and give it to this group who could only play three musical chords. Uh, but I told them, uh, whatever you want to do, including building a pistol, I'll show you how you can learn how to do that. I won't censor. So, so it had been voted down 45 to 8 by the Community Planning Board, and the Community Planning Board unanimously rejected their appeal. I said, now you want to look who has to sign off on their decision. This is not a group of local big shots. This is the Landmarks Preservation Commission. You don't get on that unless your ancestors come over on the Mayflower or you have $10 billion. I said, this is the elite of the elite. And now what you want to do is research. The names are publicly accessible. 23 of them, and I'll bet four or five of them would already be in favor of this thing. All you need is 12 of them to reject this for it to happen. So you find out who these people are and get as much biographical information. You know, IT has made this on these people, and you will find the buttons to play them like a noble organ. You know, you can find out what causes they became noteworthy for, etc., etc. And now what you're going to do, because there's 12,000 kids in this school district, is I'm going to free you from school for a month, and you're going to split up. You go from school to school, find troublemakers, and get petitions. Because what we need because your letterhead will say committee of 5,000. We need 5,000 signatures on a petition. And you're going to write an individual letter writing campaign to each of the 23 members of the community planning board asking them to please immortalize this group. Of, this, this group. Well, 
I get a phone call in the front office from someone out of class out six weeks later. And the voice on the phone says, hello, this is Yoko Ono. You know, and I thought it was one of my cockamamie friends. I said, you know, this is George Washington, Yoko. What, what's on your mind? <laughs> Fortunately, she didn't take umbrage. Maybe didn't even hear me saying it. She said, the decision has been reversed. I want to hold a party at the Dakota for these girls. Could they be released from school? Well, I don't know, Yoko. I mean, I got a missile. <laughs> So, that's one. Uh, look at this one. Here's a 12-year-old C student from, uh, well, he lived in home. Well, well, he was a C student, but he's a polite young fellow. He was going nowhere there, and he went to, he had the effrontery to go to a pizza parlor in all-white Upper West Side in 1980, and the owner of the parlor, a six-foot-six-inch crazy Greek who happened to be a friend of mine, took his pizza, took his soda, threw them away. The charge was he had taken two straws. You only let one straw, right? So he comes over ranting about racial prejudice. I said, I said, it was the wrong thing to do, and I'm going to show you how to deal with it. But I don't think it was racial prejudice. His clientele at lunch comes from the collegiate school. They wear blue blazers, gold buttons. John F. Kennedy's kid went there. They leave big tips for his staff. And they, he knows the public school kids Black or white, go in there for lunch, he's going to lose that blue ribbon trade. Nevertheless, you're going to give him a chance to back down. This is an absolutely massive, insane Greek who believes violence is the solution to all problems. Once Jerry Mulligan, the famous uh, jazz saxophonist, bounced a $10 check. He had it blown up to billboard size and mounted outside the restaurant. Okay, so I said, you go to the phone and I'll listen. And you say, I'm the guy whose pizza you took, but I'm willing to let bygones be bygones if I could. Nick hangs up on him. I said, I'm going to give you what in law is called an affidavit, that you attempted to solve this problem peaceably. Now I said, you want to go over there in person tomorrow, and I'll provide a long-distance witness, and you want to say, look, it's just a slice of pizza. Give me my slice of pizza back. But Nick had the bit between, out the kid goes. And now I said, you're going to call him one more time with a different teacher as a witness. Then you're going to write him a letter, certified return receipt requested, 65 cents in those days. And now you have four pieces of evidence to provide to the court. And then you're going to sue his ass in small claims court. Only cost like $3 in those days. But it was 17 miles from the school. The kids can't sue. I said, anyone with $3 can sue. It doesn't mean you're going to win. But the way the referee in small claims court decides, since it's one person's, is who has evidence that they acted reasonably. And you will have four pieces of evidence, and this guy will be steam coming out of his ears. Well, he was awarded triple damages. How about that? Mm -hmm. Now, what do you suppose the small claims court referee said when he got home that night to his friend? You're not going to believe what I just adjudicated. So beginning about four days later, we get a call from the Brooklyn College Law School. Could he come over and lecture? Of course, he said no. And I said, listen, I'll ruin you if you don't. We'll work it out. Then Columbia Law School called. Then we got daily calls from judges to take him out to lunch. Because isn't this a symbol that the system yeah, really? Okay. 
He's the only kid in 30 years of teaching that took my advice not to waste your time in high school. I said, any number of very good colleges will take you in at the end of your sophomore year if you provide the documentation, you're ready. He went to Duke, full tuition scholarship, then Duke University Law School, and Wait, I, oh, by the way, these two uh, events, Strawberry Fields and Pizza Palace Suit, are from the same term in a junior high school. Just a few more of these things. Here's a PhD from UCAL. Here's a 13-year-old girl who came to me complaining that her mother was a liar, said she could go to Paris alone that summer if she could raise the money. She said, I just checked and nobody, I mean, she was a single parent household, mother was a secretary. She said, nobody. I said, well, you can't do it well on a job, but there's not very much money if you have a little business. And she said, 13-year-old kid can't have businesses. I said, if you have something people want, they don't care how old you are. I mean, uh, Sean Fanning almost ruined the music business with Napster. He was 17. So she takes a week out of school, figures out a really interesting exotic business that you can read my book and find out what it was and raises enough money in a short time by cutting school for six consecutive weeks that she could afford to pay her mother's way to Paris. She came and said, I've got much more money than I need. I said, why don't you take your mother to Paris? She might appreciate it. On the basis of that, she went to what I believe is the finest college in the United States, Hampshire College, where you write your own curriculum and then you negotiate with the faculty. My granddaughter goes there, will be graduating next year. Hello, Christina. <laughs> That's all I'll say. So, what phrase in Icelandic means writing of God? Yes. <laughs> well, it's a, her real name was, well, well, oh, oh, it, it's carried popularly as Gudrun, but she wasn't satisfied just she went to court and changed it to Christina. So, hey, you know, what are you going to do? If you could say something that would echo through time and each and every person from now until the end of humanity would hear it. Yeah. Sensible children do not wish to be incomplete human beings. And so when you impose a stage theory of human development upon them, you affect or tormenting them, you're limiting their opportunity. The whole world for all history knew that childhood is over about the age of seven, and if it persists beyond the age of 12, you've got some hopeless human being on your mind. Don't be your kid's enemy because they're not a kid that's a fellow human being, male or female. Be their partner and enlarge the opportunities. No homework, please. <laughs> what does a college education really get you in the 21st century? I think it's, it's consistently given less and less. Uh, it, it, it essentially was the last hoop to jump through, but it never delivered much to most of the people who jump through that who it is possible if you understand that an education is something you have to take to use the resources that are assembled there and actually stitch together an education for yourself and get some value but most people of course follow a prescribed plan which has been put together by a committee somewhere. And in fact, 
doesn't do much for most people. I went to Cornell, Columbia, and Reed College, and I can guarantee from Cornell and Columbia, I remember nothing except the babes, the alcohol, hangovers, etc. From Reed, uh, I I got a little bit out of a Plato seminar that I do remember, basically arguing with with the uh, with the professor who encouraged that. You know, I, it it does it doesn't give you a bang for your buck unless you commit. Which who does? Isn't it supposed to produce a certificate that certifies you as eligible? The funny thing is that IT has accidentally exploded a lot of that because so many people. I remember when my daughter graduated from MIT, and she used to bitterly complain that her classmates would vanish for months at a time doing jobs for various companies, then come back as if nothing had happened and nobody punished them. Uh, <laughs> you know, sorry to say that we were so slow picking up on... Uh, you judge people by performance, not by credentials, and real people You'd be insane to hire on the basis of credentials because the skew between memory and application is so large that eventually you're top-heavy with people who don't know how to do anything much. I'm going to ask this last question. I'm going to go burn your, your DVD. Is that way you're not late? And so just uh, answer to Jitu and Tony and Kevin. What is the value of persistence as juxtaposed to the learning process? About 10 years ago, uh, I set up, a, I helped to set up a foundation that at Edison High School in New Jersey awards $10,000 a year to the most persistent student in the class. And persistence in the face of adversity is the final test. If you can stick to something, nothing is difficult to learn. I mean, nothing at all. But the natural selection process operating on a low boredom quotient on personal disrespect, I can't do that, and many other things, eliminates almost everyone except the persistent. Those are the ones who demonstrate merit. Now, obviously, a lot of the control mechanism is inherited or appointed, but the parts that aren't go to the persistent. And that includes the arts and the sciences as well as, as politics. I mean, who could imagine, for example, that an obviously inferior human being, I'm not speaking politically here, like George W. Bush, could pass through all the screens on the way up and then be elected not once but twice by the American population. He flunked his pilot's course, 25 out of 100, and now he's supposed to be given a jet to fly in combat. But of course, he pulled strings. He didn't do that. He clearly was a, an imbecile. He looked like an imbecile, he talked like an imbecile, and you cannot believe that any decisions attributed to him were actually made by him. No one would be crazy enough to put, put him in charge and say, you mind the store and I'll go off. So, but he was persistent, 
and he did reject the negative assessments that occurred all through his life. What a rock is about, in my opinion, is showing daddy that the people who embarrassed daddy got their comeuppance. And who the hell cares that the carnage is that he's one of the great mass murderers in history. But daddy, daddy's reputation was saved from disgrace. <sighs> what do you feel the role of UNESCO has been in the, the manipulation of the educational? Program? Well, I, I'm bothered a little bit by the general mass of, of conspiracy literature attributes powers to the United Nations, which it simply doesn't have. That doesn't mean that it isn't filled with villainous intentions. I mean that it never succeeded in becoming People say it's a respectable institution, but they don't be. No one says, "What does the UN say about?" No one says that, mm. you, you know. And they've almost given up trying. I mean, there's now a, a minority opinion that it's not worth spending the money to have it in the United States, mm. you know, because it's as much anti-American as, as it carries out our subtler designs. I've noticed that UNESCO uh, focuses a lot of their their workings on the educational uh, oh, yeah. work of nations. And you go to the But you and I would too. Pestalozzi and Herbart and Wundt are all Yeah, yeah, of course. But well, wouldn't anyone say it's easier to deal with unformed minds with no experience? Wean them it's away. Of, yeah. Uh, I mean, it just... It, it's in an engineering sense what you would expect to happen, and so we wouldn't be surprised that that's what does happen. Uh, Who was Johann Pestalozzi, and what were some of his well, few ideas? The 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 most intriguing thing about the followers of Pestalozzi are that they never count the fact that every single one of his projects quickly failed. Every single one of them. What he had that was intriguing to the Prussian hierarchy and really the global hierarchy was that he, his method of kindness, and it may have been sincere, his method of kindness was a new weapon in the arsenal of, instead of whipping the poor, threatening them, menacing them, tormenting them, you killed them with kindness. The, the written principles of the Fabians are Pestalozian, you know, by extending this blanket of kindness to people. It, it, it's still uh, effective in, in that, uh, you know, lots of, lots of, a big fraction of the American population expects charity and sees it as a blessing. Now, it's not hard to see why in a, on this day or that day it could be a blessing, but overall, that you get weaker and weaker, it's like your arm gets weaker if it doesn't lift stuff above your head. I mean, it's, it's such a, a fundamental principle of human physics, including mental physics, that to pull the wool over so many people's eyes. <laughs> I got your disc. It's got all the transcripts from your Gnostic Media interviews. You oh, grand. Of liberal and, and some Gordon Lawson. Thank you. For you. You also talked about the cruise to open up. Uh, oh, Asia. excellent. And this is. Uh, excellent. This is, uh, Taft. Uh, Taft's on the. It's Roosevelt's daughter. Roosevelt's president. Taft goes with her and they open up. They go back to Japan after. Uh, who is the admiral that you mentioned that went over there? Uh, 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 not Dewey, uh, 
But you know what I'm saying? They had already gone over yeah. there, and this was the second one, and then this sets up the whole World War II, World War I, the whole scenario, the opium smuggling, it's all in there. And this guy wrote uh, Flags of Our Fathers and Flyboys. Oh, yes. James Bradley. Yes. And so I thought you might. Thank you. I will. You will enjoy it. And you did an outstanding job. Hey, I, I, this has been a, a, a lovely course in how complicated it is, you know, to make a, to get the word out. Have you have you seen this book? No. Called the Perfectibilist. It's uh, by Terry Mullinson. No. That was the name of the Illuminati before it was known as the Illuminati. It was the Perfectibilists, and they were a private club. And this means. Per me, khaki vita means through me the blind become sighted. So their top secret is the trivium and learning, but they use it out of order, so they don't establish what exists first. They assert logic without. No, no, no. If you, if you look in the back, it has a full glossary of individuals. All the members. Of uh, yeah, he's cataloged. Now this is my copy, but I want you to take it, and I can get another one. Oh, and then you can God bless. It. Chris Milligan. And God this, bless. This here is the uh, the reference of Carl Wundt. And it goes into some of his colleagues, and you'll have a lot of references to your own material. Thank you all, and certainly. Now you got a heavy bag to carry. Now I got a heavy bag to carry. I'll take it for you. Let me get your mic off, yeah? Yes. You've now experienced the first step of the ultimate history lesson. We've done the hard work of organizing the facts, and now it's up to you to think, learn, communicate, and take action among yourselves. But we don't expect you to do this alone, and in fact, since this message applies to all of us, it's truly a circumstance which unites us and makes us indivisible, so that we might deliver freedom and justice, not just to ourselves, but to people around the world. If there is a point to all of this, it might be in realizing that the system isn't broken. It was built this way on purpose. It serves those who created it, not those who are managed by it. As a result, our potential as human beings has been undermined, our birthright has been stolen, and our adolescent period of life has been extended indefinitely. We have been numbed to these facts, which have been obscured further by the 15,000 hours of public schooling, which is mandatory in order to earn the right to live and work in our civilized culture. We have been under the impression that public schooling was about educating us as a measure to prepare us for life, but those assumptions were formed based upon information supplied to us by our natural predators, who may dress and speak like us, but in their minds, intentions, and actions, they hold us in contempt. They manage us like livestock, and they poison us both figuratively and literally, as if we were pests. Each of us has a choice to make, and the question is, what is most important to us? Is it the products which money buys, or is it having a safe, happy, and healthy family? Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that we can have both in this culture. We must choose to either put our full support behind that which is most important to us, or face losing everything. I made that choice eight years ago, and through the help of some friends, I transformed the materials around me into the resources which have delivered this message to you. In the minutes before Patrick Henry spoke into existence the phrase, give me liberty or give me death, in his speech to the Second Virginia Convention on March 23rd, 1775, he first addressed the convention's president, Peyton Randolph of Williamsburg, quote, For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery, and in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and to fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time, through fear of giving offense, I should consider myself guilty of treason towards my country, and an act of disloyalty toward the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly kings. Mr. President, it is natural to man 
to indulge in the illusions of hope. We are apt to shut our eyes against painful truth and listen to the song of that siren until she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to being of the number of those having eyes, see not, and having ears, hear not, the things which so nearly concern their temporal salvation? For my part, whatever anguish of spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. End quote. So, if you realize that your family and or community was in danger, how would you make them aware of it as a measure to protect them from the peril? Well, once you meet and surmount the mental obstacles by employing your use of reason, it would then be logical to organize the facts, connect and communicate with your loved ones and community, to learn together how to dispel confusion, how to take informed constructive actions, and when you meet resistance, how to learn your way forward. It doesn't benefit anyone to continue to sanitize the world for our youth as it prevents them from developing a strong immune system and thereby undermines their chances of survival in this world. To that end, as I mentioned in the introduction, we've also created the ultimatehistorylesson.com which specifically hosts the YouTube version of this interview in video form as well as the MP3 versions for your downloading pleasure as well as the transcript, references, notes, links, primary source materials and every other piece of media associated with this interview set, all with the goal of helping you to understand. And while this all might sound like a good idea, most people need a little help outgrowing the habits which enable us to be so easily manipulated. In order to help each and every individual tap into their internal natural resources, we created TragedyAndHope.com, which acts as a next step for those who seek to learn more after screening our productions. Now that you've heard John talk about the book, Tragedy and Hope, A History of the World in Our Time by Dr. Carol Quigley, you'll indeed appreciate the fact that we've created an international network of independent media producers, all of whom consistently provide educational films, podcasts, and video reports, commercial free and free to the public. With over 1,400 people from all over the world posting videos, posting blogs, forming study and research groups, and learning the arts of intellectual self-defense and strategic problem solving, we have built a truly unique experience which has thus far been denied to the general public. And it is in every way designed to help you realize your birthright. In this last hour, I was surprised to learn about John's key role and helping Yoko Ono get approval to create Strawberry Fields, a section of Central Park in New York dedicated to John Lennon, across the street from where he was shot in front of the Dakota Hotel. We've done a lot since creating Tragedy and Hope in 2009, so let me share a bit of synchronicity about how all this began. These are the last few pages of the premier issue of our interactive magazine before it evolved into an interactive community of critical thinkers. I'd say that not only have we come a long way, but we've also stayed on track, and I think that's reflected in the synchronicity of these full circle moments. We're serious about studying the big problems, identifying the root causes, and enacting constructive solutions. And we sure could use your help. And in return, we'll help you catch up on what you've been missing. We must ask the questions, can we have peace without understanding the root causes of war? Can we have liberty without the responsibility and reason incorporated into our actions to bring it about? Why aren't we preparing our children for their lives? Why doesn't public schooling prepare us for the fact that we are entering a world where there are predators and systems of predation to be avoided? And in learning the answers, we found that it's due to the fact that the predators designed the public schooling system. It's time to reclaim our birthright, and this interview is aimed at delivering it to you. What you do with it is your choice. Figure out how to teach yourself anything by asking substantial questions and identifying valid answers. 
Help us create a network of affiliates and continue to spread this message of self-liberation. By understanding the problems, the solutions become known. The truth is the future, and we want to see what the world looks like when you develop the habits which reveal your inner potential. Last but not least, learn how to use the active literacies to liberate yourself and share what you've learned with others. Because the world is made up of words, and if you know the right words, you can make of the world what you will. Go and do likewise. Be persistent. Refuse to give your consent to irrationality and realize that in your heart and mind that we are only victims until we mature and take responsibility for our thoughts and actions. And to that end, keep learning, keep moving forward. Thank you for tuning in and not dropping out. Thank you.